Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. And would like to call this meeting to order. Do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Brinsby. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jens. Good morning. Okay, so we were on to our operating amendments. Uh, we have two remaining, uh, which are additions. And I'll start with Councillor Cartmel. Uh, uh, that'll be amendment number 16. Councillor Cartmel, go ahead, please. Good morning, thank you. Uh, so amendment number 16 is to add $449,000 in 2025 and $37,000 in 2026 on an ongoing basis, uh, essentially to the Edmonton Public Library to allow expansion of the Heritage Valley branch, uh, as outlined on page 41 of attachment 2. Uh, so I yes, seconded, seconded by, sorry, oh. this was seconded by Councillor Paquette. Yeah, got it. Good, go ahead. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. So I, uh, I had the privilege of representing this part of the city uh, in, in the previous term when this branch was first opened. And uh, it's roughly 3,000 square feet, which is a little bigger than a Starbucks. Uh, and it was immediately overwhelmed. Uh, it's, uh, it serves a pretty large community, roughly 60,000 residents south of the Hende and west of, or pardon me, east of uh, White Mud Creek. And so there's a lot of kids there, there's a lot of demand on that space, and uh, there's, it, it's simply overwhelmed in the size that it is. So this adds operating dollars uh, so the library can operate a larger branch, uh, one that would be roughly 10,000 square feet. Uh, starting in 2025. The reason this needs to be moved and approved today is that this will allow the library to go off and do all the renovations to expand that space effectively to spend the capital dollars that will create the larger branch that would then be operated by these funds. So it doesn't affect this year's tax levy, levy certainly affects next year's tax levy. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to have that uh, highly anticipated conversation at the spring SOBA ahead of the tax levy conversation that we get to reconcile a lot of these things. So uh, approving this for now against the tax levy does not necessarily mean that it sits there forever, but it does allow the library to proceed with their work and uh, complete their plans. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Questions? Questions, colleagues? Okay, here you go, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Maybe uh, briefly to the movers. So my memory um, is that they are expanding these services, providing this additional space with no uh, capital budget ask either. Is that correct? That is correct. They, uh, I don't know the exact circumstances, but either within the resources they already have or with in partnership with the ownership of the building that they occupy, the, those... And again, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but that's often the part of a lease agreement is that mm -hmm. the renovations are done for you. So when we think about the cost um, to our capital budget of building a new facility or trying to get a new branch up and running, this is a this is it's, it's zero dollars for for zero capital dollars, a little bit of operating dollars. Yeah. Um, I guess as a reference point, uh, not necessarily to speak for the library, but the next standalone branch to be built would be in Riverbend. And there is a capital profile for that that takes it, I think, to checkpoint two. Uh, I stand to be corrected. Nothing's being asked for that, yeah. you know, respecting the financial pressures of the city. That would be a roughly 19,000 square foot building. That's what a new branch kind of looks like. So this is, you know, by comparison, roughly half the size of a new branch. Yeah. And then my memory as well is that there was an ask for this branch um, expansion last year. Uh, but I think that the operating ask is now about half of what it was previously. They really 
sought ways to make it um, as efficient as possible? Uh, that's my understanding. Um, Councillor Principe is the rep might have more information ah. on that part of it, yes. Uh, I, I don't know if I can ask her, but maybe she'll have some questions. But I, I think yeah. I, we we have left flexibility in procedures, right? And she's the rep on the uh, library. I think it will be nice to hear her perspective. Thank you. I appreciate that you giving me the opportunity to speak this, to this. And I, I like the questions you're asking because it gives me the opportunity to uh, let everyone know how the library really has done a lot. They they do their own um, OP12 uh, exercise consistently and this is an example of it where they worked hard to find money and find uh, ways to be more efficient in order to decrease the the ask from yeah significantly as you as you can see and there there is uh, a huge demand for this there is there is a great need for this there are many I've seen pictures and I've, I've visited there and I've seen many children uh, in the facility and, and they need more space. They would like to be able to uh, accommodate more people. And uh, yeah, so th that's all what I wanted to share. So thanks for asking. Great, thank you. Those were all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you for this. Um, uh, to Ms. Padbury, what would the impact be on the tax levy of approving this? If this amendment passes, we would be at 6.6% for 2024, 5.3% for 2025, and 4.7% for 2026. Sorry, what was 2025? 5.3. 5.3. 6.6, 5.3, 4.7. Uh, 5. 5. Oh, so, so, 6. 6, and what is it? what is the tax levy impact if we don't approve this? So where, where are we now in the status quo? Give me one second here. It actually doesn't change it at 6.6, 5.3, and 4.7. Thank you. Because it's rounding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, Councillor Wright. I, I'm just wondering um, the capital profile for River Band. I, I'm just wondering is this, wouldn't that take some of the pressure off um, this location here once that is open? Well, yeah. Um, Yes and no. Uh, the Hende is a big barrier uh, to to movement uh, from south of the Hende to the north to north of the Hende. Mm -hmm. um, you have Calgary Trail, and then the next crossing uh, is Rabbit Hill Road. Yeah, so this this, the, this like, location is the only one that is south of this is of the, the Hende, yeah. and it's actually the. Uh, Outside of the of the police station and the fire hall, it's the actu actually the only sort of public serving amenity at all south of the Hende. Okay. And and I'm not sure whether you or maybe admin or maybe <laughs> Councillor Principe know, um, are all of our um, EPL branches 10,000 square feet? I think that's what this is proposing. So to I think Ms. Martinez is on the line. She might have a better answer to that, or or Councillor Principe. Okay, Ms. Martinez, do you are you there? Are you on mute? Laura, are you there? Sorry. Here you are. Go ahead. Please. Yes. Yes, yeah. I am. Sorry. I had a phone call from Lisa. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> are, are all are all your EPL branches 10,000 square feet or more? No, it, it, it depends on the branch. Uh, I would say the it, it depends. Some are, are larger, some are a little bit smaller, but yeah, the average space now for a, a medium-sized branch is we're, we're allocating 15,000 square feet. Okay. Oh, I thought when you were in um, last week it was um, 10,000. But this this will become 10,000 or 15,000? This will be, be a 10,000 square foot space. Okay. And how are the other areas um, south of the Hende serviced? I, I'm thinking um, uh, the Orchard, Summerside. They, well, they are not, they are underserved because we don't have physical bricks and mortar branches there, but we do have literacy vans that go out particularly in the warmer months that can set up in school grounds or we've provided service in banks uh, to be able to serve those folks who don't have a, a library branch. 
Heritage Valley, though, is, is one of the fastest growing uh, communities population-wise in Edmonton, and they just don't have facilities there. And I think the public library is a space, particularly in economic hard hardship, that becomes even more essential. Okay, but can can you not provide the same service with with the with the literacy vans? No, there it's a van, so you need the physical space for folks to be able to have a sing, sign, laugh, and learn program. Um, the, the, Demand for public public computers is not able to be met through the literacy van. The literacy van is really just a stopgap to provide some level of service, but but it wouldn't do the same thing as an expanded ten thousand square foot space at all. And I think that sing sign laugh and learn is done. I think at one of the um, the centers in in Summerside. Is that right? Yeah, we do them all across the areas of the city that don't have are not served easily by a public library. Okay, um, I, yeah, I, I just don't know if this is like somewhat short-sighted expanding this one when the Riverbend one is, uh, when we got a profile for that. I, I'm gonna have to think on this, thank you. I think the Riverbend one is many, many years out given the current situation with capital funding. Oh, and maybe if I can ask administration, cause I, I haven't looked at this myself. Is there a profile for um, an uh, EPL branch in, the, the southeast section, south of the Hande? I, I don't believe so, but uh, perhaps Ms. Martinez can weigh in on that too. Sorry, thanks, Stacey. You know, I'm not, I, we have our capital priorities are something that the board approves um, in time for the budget and Heritage Valley uh, is certainly in the plan and we, uh, as a co-located facility. So I believe we are in discussion with the city regarding a future recreation site in that area. However, again, it's at least a decade or more out. Okay, thank you very much. My time is up. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to go to Pilar first. Thank you for being here today. Um, can you give me a sense of how many current EPL branches are underserved? Obviously, current. the Heritage Valley. Would How many other ones that are currently in existence would you say? Are, are not underserved, sorry, are, are over capacity is what I meant to say. There is nothing comparable to Heritage Valley in terms I'm of being- I'm not asking about comparable, I'm just asking yeah. for a scope and scale of how many branches in- I would say the next one would be Riverbend. That doesn't have one yet? Sorry, I thought you said under, that are no, over I'm, capacity. Of the current Edmonton Public Library branches. So ones that exist today. Yes, how Riverbend many, exists. Okay, how many of them are over capacity? Because I remember in a conversation you mentioned a few others. I'm just trying to get a scope and scale of this. Yeah, there are a couple. I, as I mentioned Riverbend, Woodcroft would be another one um, that is in need of uh, additional and rearranged, yeah. more effective, efficient space. And that's those are the two that so only, would be the so only two are really over capacity right now? Yes, three. And three, three with Heritage Valley. Yeah. And then how many future uh, branches are in the capital plan for like the next 10 to 15 year horizon? You know, I have to, I don't have my cap, our capital plan off the top of my fingers, but they would be, obviously we've got Lewis Farms, which is under construction. That's a small little branch. Um, the Pilot Sound area of the city is where we have another one that we would want to expand and then into the south. The southeast? Yes. Okay. And we always, again, we work with the city and other partners because we recognize the benefit of the co-located facilities. So sometimes yeah. the timelines, many times the timelines are dependent on uh, those projects as well. Co-location with other city facilities, right? Correct. Okay, perfect, thank you for that. And um, I guess just to the mover, one of the things I'm grappling with, because I do want to support the library, I think we all 
love the library is we've had other agencies, boards, and commissions and arm's length organizations come to council this budget and ask for funding as well that we haven't put forward given our current context. So how do, how do we, I guess, why, why the library in your opinion? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I rattled through quickly and rather glibly a number of subsequent motions that I want to make that address some of those other ABCs that I think, uh, where I think that there is some analysis to be done uh, in preparation of, of perhaps adjusting their allocations. Uh, there's not the same urgency, I would say. So again, I, I'm building on the premise that we're all holding close this notion that we're going to have uh, a elongated, detailed conversation in the spring, informed by OP12 savings, informed by the provincial education requisition, informed by all of the data points that we don't have today, where we can begin to address those other things. In this instance, though, this agency needs to go and do its work. And I would also say that of all of our ABCs, this is the one that said, you know what, you made a bit of a error and we're giving you back our over allocation. Um, they could have sat on that and yep. done this all by themselves. They didn't. So I think that, sure, that there's some value in that. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, that's a little provocative. There's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a pointy stick part to that mm -hmm. comment. But I, uh, I think they've say, treated us fairly and I think they've got a reasonable case. Yeah, and they've also been in the spirit of the, the reductions, the OP-12. Uh, well, long before we said the words OP-12, yeah. the library has always demonstrated that but, ethic. But the big differenti differentiating thing between this and the other ABCs is that they need a decision today, but we have the time through 2024 to do some more work for the budget that's starting in 2025. Yeah, they need a commitment today. But They need a commitment, but it's also that we have the gap time to do the work. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Jans. I'm just curious uh, to the mover, is this branch in your ward? No, sir. It, uh, uh, it was in the ward I represented in the previous term, but the ward boundaries changed. And so I no longer represent Heritage Valley. I did prior to 2021. Oh. So I was, uh, I was the ward councillor when this branch first opened. So I'm, I'm just wondering why the ward councillor isn't moving this request. I have no idea. Is the ward councillor available to comment? I don't think that will be appropriate. Oh, no, I'm sorry, councillor. You can sign Mayor, up. You can I, si I can comment. I can answer oh, a question. Sorry. Yeah, you can sign up to spe uh, ask questions, councillor Rice, because. Oh, uh, okay. So I can answer that question. No, no. It. Just hold on, councillor Rice. You can answer. You can sign up to ask questions and then through those questions maybe show your support or not support. I think that will be a better process because Councillor Rice is not on the on the library board and there's no obligation on ward councillors to be bringing forward. Uh, there's no restriction on any councillor to bring forward anything that they think is important. doesn't matter whether they're in the, that's in their ward or not, right? So I, I'm going to rule that question out of order. Sorry about that. Okay, may I ask, what if, if this branch is not funded, what is the library's next operational priority? That would be a good question to Pilar. Thank you, Councillor Jantz. That's an excellent question. Uh, we have our 2024-26 strategic plan that is filled with other priorities. Uh, the closing the digital divide with our digital navigators would be one along with additional staff to provide the sing, sign, laugh and learn uh, early literacy programming. So those are just the two off the top of my head that would easily um, be implemented. So what about some of the areas that are currently served with bookmobiles? Would there be, like, is there commensurate value in looking at other storefronts or, or I, could you speak to the process of how that's been evaluated about equity in all parts of the city? So the board, we follow the board's uh, policy, the branch development or service point development policy that 
establishes criteria and principles for uh, when we implement or establish a priority for capital projects. And the literacy bands, we have four of them that go out to underserved areas of the community that are identified as a certain distance from their nearest branch or having barriers. Um, so with those four bands, we are able to provide as much service as we can within a uh, space that's available from the community. Okay. All right. Um... I appreciate that. I'll reflect on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Mr. Mayor, I do not have a question. Uh, I, can I use this opportunity to answer the earlier question, or you want me? You can speak. You can speak to what your views are when we come to this, okay. to, to the speaker. Okay. Portion. Yeah. So I I can speak for that. Okay. Thank you. All right, so Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? I have the chair. I just have a couple of questions, Pilar. I, I, I think I understand the urgency because we reached out to you as well to understand whether this can wait until April or not. And the uh, answer I got back is that no, you need a decision before December, and Councillor Cartmill reiterated that as well. What I want to understand is that if, if okay, if council approves this, how much pressure that actually takes off on the urgency of the Riverbend location uh, uh, expansion? Or, uh, sorry, uh, new build. It's it's a really good question. Actually, it takes the pressure off uh, White Mud and more than it does the Riverbend branch. Riverbend also serves a huge population. Uh, so I don't I don't know that it will impact Riverbend as a, as much as it would uh, uh, White Mud, which is uh, which has the capacity in terms of space uh, to provide that additional service. Uh, but it 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 doesn't detract from the need to expand the Riverbend branch. What it does do is better serve that community in the meantime until we can build a co-located facility in that area of the city. So Riverbend is an existing branch, right, at, uh, uh, just off uh, Calgary Trail and, uh, and uh, White Mud, right? Correct. And the, the White Mud is the new proposed expansion? No, White Mud is near, it's, uh, it's on the White Mud Drive. It's an existing branch. It's about a it's about a twenty five thousand square square foot oh, branch. Oh yes, yes, yeah. Got yeah. it, got it, got it, got yeah. it. I should know my libraries better. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's been a while. It's <laughs> if I could just speak to the reason why we uh, are in in a more immediate need for an answer is because the space that's available to expand is decreasing. The vacancy rate is is decreasing, and, and the options are becoming limited. Even within the, the year uh, from when we had proposed this last year, uh, there are limited options because that area of the city is in demand for other services. Okay, can you repeat again, like what what is the urgency of making a decision today? What can we wait till April? Because I think there will be very robust discussion before the mill rate is set around other priorities and uh, so I just want to get a sense again from you on the uh, why the, it is important to make that decision now not wait till why can't we wait till April it's a, it's a very good question and I think we we have we're working with a landlord to expand within that vicinity and the options for expansion are becoming less and less uh, because that demand on that uh, space is, is increasing. So we have, the longer we wait, there could be the case that we do not have an opportunity to expand because there is no space to expand. Oh, I see. So the landlord so, may lease yes. that space to someone else? Yes. And then we have the opportunity to, it'll take a year for us to do the fit up that we have um, some capital funding in reserve that we can use for this expansion and um, at least have a, an opp opportunity for folks to use a library until we're able to build a full service point. Good. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. And You're welcome. Thank you thank for you. joining us. Okay, so that concludes the questions on this. Uh, now to speak.
Okay, please sign up to speak. All right, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, appreciate the discussion on this. There were some great questions, and, and I think, so I don't want to repeat a lot of the, what I would want to speak to uh, that were answered in questions. I, I really actually more wanted to echo, I think, some of the questions that Councillor Rutherford had asked. Um, for me, what makes this different is, is a few things. One, the, the immediate sense of urgency that we've heard about. I'm not going to repeat anything to do with that. Um, and, and the second is EPL's ongoing commitment to really embracing the cost savings that we, we are working for in every other area. Um, I don't want to comment too much on OP12 and other cost saving exercises amongst other ABCs, um, but, but I don't think they're at the same level I would have expected yet. Um, whereas EPL has shown time and time and time and time again, literally over more than a decade at this point now, that they, they fully embody that desire of continuous improvement, trying to find cost savings, including on this, which is a lower ask than what we were presented with a year ago. Um, and, and so I, I feel very comfortable and I don't want to gloss over the fact that, I mean, I appreciate Councilor Hamilton, Hamilton's question that this doesn't technically have an increase in 2025, but it's, it's point zero something, point zero two. So there is still an increase. Like we don't want to be so dismissive of the fact that there is still an impact to the tax levy and that will require people pay more. Um, and yet I think this is something having had a satellite branch in the West End, in the West Henday, which is not quite at the same usage as, as Heritage Valley, but it has that, uh, sig it is significantly over capacity, but, uh, uh, and the challenge is it means that a lot of the programs that many families would access, they haven't been able to for really since it opened, and, and we're running into the same thing in this location. And so I think this is a, a financially prudent way to provide substantially more service and f far more programming um, than building a whole new branch, which we just don't really have a lot of capacity for. Um, and I also appreciate that this is the recommendation of the board. This wasn't just a random ask, um, you know, sort of picked out. We've, we've got an order of things that we need to do. We need to do this. I know on the capital plan, I, I can't remember the firm order at this point, but I think Woodcroft's near the, near the top as well as uh, the River Bend and those, those locations we need to continue to go through in a thoughtful and deliberate way to, to approve that. So uh, it's for those reasons I, I think we need to, to support this. And, and I'll offer the last point, and I think just to echo what Councillor Cartmel had said in response to another question is that I would hope that through the OP12 exercise that we can start finding some more substantial savings. Uh, with where we're at today, we are far off the, um, the 240 number. and. I would look at something like library services as a core service that I would want to be supported by OP12. And since this funding doesn't come into effect until 2025, we do have the year to ideally identify savings, gosh, I hope more than $449,000 in the next year to identify towards other key priorities like this and other things that are gonna be talked about through the subsequent motion. So, uh, it's for all of those reasons I, I appreciate that we, we should and, and this council has been very deliberate and thoughtful and, and carefully scrutinized this ask, um, but I'm comfortable with what I've heard of, of supporting this so that they can continue to serve uh, as much as I'd love to say that the area represents the fastest growing, it's not, the, this is the fastest growing part of the city by, by a large margin. And we need to make sure, well, we're not even keeping up with services by approving this. We're just sort of staying afloat and, uh, and trying to manage that growth as best we can. So I'll support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful we have many competing uh, priorities in the city. Uh, I think about uh, some of the youth who are in crisis in the River Valley and along White Avenue. Um, I think about the broad safety concerns we've been hearing about from Edmontonians and just the well-being. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'll be supporting this ask. I think that we know that early childhood learning and any work we can do to minimize adverse childhood experiences and supporting um, uh, kids, especially at the most vulnerable ages and, and those, those first five years, those key first five years are essential. 
And uh, I think one of the best things our council did was actually, and, and not many people have talked about it, but it's opening the library branches at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Um, having that extra weekend time available is a, a game changer. Um, I you know, recently was at the library and there was a lineup of parents waiting to get in at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And it was, uh, you know, when I, th I think about the impact that this will be able to have um, on, on many youngsters, on many adults, on many community members in general, um, this is the kind of investment that makes me proud to pay taxes. This is the kind of investment that um, makes me excited that we're investing in the next generation, that hopefully those kids will have a head start, those kids will have a fresh start, and won't end up like many of their, um, sadly, uh, many of the peers who have uh, uh, fallen along the way. So uh, I think the, the library, as indicated by my colleagues, has done a, you know a, a much better a much better job and a very nimble job compared to compared to some others and uh, as such I think this is a, a sound investment so I'm I'm mindful of the um, tax increase I'm mindful of uh, having to spend every dollar judiciously but I think this is one that um, if we we're starting from scratch if we we're at zero I think we'd be funding so uh, with that confidence I think we can uh, go forth and uh, make sure that uh, we we make other adjustments elsewhere on areas with less of a as evidence-based return as the library. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. He and I heard many great points and my colleagues brought up and speak up. Um, I agree with all the, those points. I don't I don't want to repeat that. Um, like many of you already said, and this is a fast growing uh, party uh, in the city and there are many, many younger families, many, many younger kids. Uh, that is actually our hope, our future. Um, this this site, this branch, and then because the small size and then with a huge population around that area, that is only one, like earlier, uh, my colleague mentioned, that's only one public services in that uh, South Hand area. Um, I actually visited a few times and I can see that overpacked and how many people line up and then to waiting for the service to get booked and even to have these spaces and for our children for the programs. That is really, really challenge. Uh, but I can say the staff work really, really hard there. Um, they provide a lot of support and to, to the family and to the kids around that area. Um, I just want to say um, I agree with um, Councillor said about this is a tax actually EPL for people. This is our core services. This is people willing to pay tax for and specific for future uh, our future uh, leader and kids and then uh, willing to learn there and participate in the programs there. Um, this amendment was on my list. I actually I have like almost like 10 amendments and because it's already stated before of me, that is why I don't need to repeat it stated. Otherwise, if it was not stated, I will state it uh, and bring up. And for my uh, amendment, the only difference is the funding sources, a little bit different, uh, but it gives it, um, gives it this amount of funding requested. Um, we can say um, the impact for the tax is not significant, significant, and specifically start in 2025. So I thank my my colleagues on understanding the importance of this uh, operation services uh, to be funded. And thank you. That's all from me. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, well, I. I Sorry. Well, I acknowledge um, the service that that the libraries provide to um, to our community. I'm I, I'm just not sure um, that we should be making this decision right now. I'm thinking, you know, if we do put it off to OP12, because I, I do think it is it is a priority. But if we do put it off until the spring, um, perhaps the the landlord can can maybe wait on their decision, especially knowing that they would be getting a stable long-term um, leasing opportunity with this. So, you know, and I, so we're holding off a num number of asks. Um, so I think we should wait until the spring, see what OP12 uh, brings to us. 
I've heard it said here today that it's one of the, this is one of the fastest growing areas of the city. I, I don't know sort of what the geographical um, area is that we're talking about, but I'm also concerned about those areas of the city that have already grown and perhaps aren't being served um, as they should be. Um, so I guess for those reasons, I'm, I'm not able to support the request at this time, but look forward to it coming back as part of the OP12. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you so much. I, I think I uh, owe a little bit of explanation to uh, my colleagues about, because uh, uh, this has been, uh, uh, like, as part of a multi, uh, omnibus, multi-part motion, we have been debating whether to include this in that, and I haven't included, I haven't taken it out, right? And I think the reason for taking it out of the multi-part motion was that number of council members who had other priorities in their wards really stepped up to show constraint that they were not gonna bring forward what their, what their constituents needed uh, in uh, uh, and, and something that they've been being uh, asked to uh, br br bring forward for council's consideration to uh, to uh, to fund. So I I really appreciate that. I just want to highlight that I deeply deeply appreciate that commitment from council members who showed that constraint, constraint and held back on uh, on on what they needed to advocate for their ward. I think that opportunity will present us in. Uh, in, in April, and I've been struggling with this too because of that compromise that council members made, but I'm also cognizant that this is an opportunity that we may lose, right? So I'm leaning towards supporting it because of that opportunity. Uh, uh, yes, can we wait till April? And uh, maybe, that's a, is that risk worth taking? I don't know. Would landlord wait or not wait, right? Would the lease go up or not, I don't know, right? That's one reason. The second is I think they will take up some pressure of other uh, other capital profile, right? And maybe give us a little wiggle room in, uh, in, in, the, in, in that part of the, uh, the city where uh, population, we have seen significant population growth as we have seen in other parts of the city as, uh, uh, as well. That's what I'm leaning towards supporting this. And I, I think it's very important for us to recognize that not every agency and civic agency that we fund shows up the way that library does to align their efforts with city administration's efforts when it comes to cost reductions. Actually, as Councilor Cartmill said, they have been actually leading that before we started uh, 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 leaning on, uh, um, uh, maybe I, that's not the right correct, correctization because city has been leaning on, on, on cost reductions as well, right? I think, uh, and uh, library, without any, uh, you know, prodding from us, stepped up, say, you know, we're going to align ourselves with OB12, and uh, they reduced their ask from one point two million dollars to a little more, more than four hundred thousand dollars. I think that is, I think that's worth recognizing. That effort is worth recognizing. So. Uh, uh, I uh, I really appreciate council members compromising. Uh, I hope that we can support this and hopefully come up with ideas come April on some of the other issues that ward councillors want to bring forward, and then we can consider them at them at, at that that time. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, I will take the chair back, and I'll go to councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, as um, the council member who sits on the board for EPL, I did want to uh, have, uh, I did want to say a few words. Uh, I just want to recognize that EPL, as I said uh, earlier, they have shown uh, fiscal responsibility. They have shown uh, how they are willing to consistently find efficiencies and uh, also, council did request that any of the ABCs that wanted to come forward with any funding requests that they demonstrate how they found efficiencies. And EPL has proven that they are doing that. 
it's not very often that I will, I don't uh, support a lot of things uh, going towards the tax levy, but this is one thing where I see a minimal impact on the tax levy, but a huge impact for Edmontonians. And uh, all the boards I'm on, I'm always challenging and encouraging them to find uh, efficiencies and being fiscally responsible. And I, I think EPL has proven that they have done so. So I'm planning to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Principal Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really feel compelled to, to speak today about this, this item. And I first want to say um, thank you to the mover. I completely understand your need and desire to, to bring this forward. It, you know, it is so time sensitive. And, and I don't think it's ward specific actually. Um, I, I think that when the library functions for any part of the city, it benefits all of the city. And, you know, I, one of the things that we are continually getting in our inbox is, um, you know, find more efficiencies, find more efficiencies. But this is a very, very great example. One of the reasons I asked these questions was because this is an example of the cost of growth. The cost of growth. You know, not only is this already at capacity, but we could probably build, well, re we, could all, we could expand two other libraries and build out three other library branches and we probably still would have demand, right? So like, I think it's very, very important to recognize that this is, this is, this is, this is an example of the crossroads we're at with these tax levies of not being able to just find efficiencies when we're meeting and pressured with this growth component. Um, so I feel like that's just something I really wanted to highlight for anybody, <laughs> the five people watching this, <laughs> this live stream today. Um, I do also appreciate uh, the mayor not putting it in the multi-part amendment um, because I think it needed to be debated on its own merit. Um, I, I think we needed to have this conversation about this particular library branch. And I, I will be transparent that I was one of the key drivers and pushers to not have it in the multi-part amendment. And the reason I didn't want it in the multi-part amendment was because I, while this is benefit, this benefits the entire city, I still have to be able to say to the residents that I serve, Yes, your, your property taxes at this point are going up, what, 6.6% 6 .6 for 2024, and, and now, yes, it's nominal, but, you know, what can I point to that says, these are the benefits specifically that you will see in this area? And it doesn't mean that all 7% they need to see the benefit from, or 6.6%, .6%, but what benefits will you see on the ground in this work and we took out really important things like the trim cycles to delay that conversation. We took out really in important things like, uh, yeah, the, the, the snow, the assisted snow clearing for seniors, uh, which again doesn't affect the tax levy but we still showed restraint. Uh, we uh, made sure to uh, just show complete restraint on so many factors so that we're creating a sense of a buffer in our budget because that's what we need to do right now. We can't create a budget that's so thin that we don't have that buffer. Um, so I will still be voting no to this, this amendment because I have to stay value-based to, you know, the fact that if I was gonna support this, I should have supported it in a multi-part amendment. I feel it's important to explain why I'm not supporting it, and it is not for any lack of support for the library. It is just all of the other worthy things that we need to support that we are not funding. I, I have a hard time going back to my residence and then justifying this one. Um, so for that reason, I won't support it, but I do completely understand, because it's, it's the, probably the hardest decision of this budget amendment process for all of us, 
I do understand the intent of the mover, and so thank you again. I do understand the the challenges that the mayor faces, and and you know with creating that omnibus or multi-part amendment, and now probably likely supporting it. Um, and I hope that the library and PLR who's listening knows that again we've had personal one-on-one -on -one conversations. This by no means doesn't mean I'm not an advocate for the library. It by no means means that. I don't want to see this succeed. I'm just looking at this from the bigger picture of consistency across ABCs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, this is a this is a very very difficult one. Even you know, I signed on to speak last because I have been sitting here, and I think you know all the reasons to do it is is. Um, is so strong, put forward by my colleagues. Um, and I'm, lo I'm looking at you and hearing you speak, Pilar, and I know the great work that you all, you and your team um, do on a daily basis. And I think this decision ultimately isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily question the, the merit or the quality. Um, for me, I echo a lot of the points shared by Councilor Rutherford here and you know, there were things in this budget that um, I supported. There were things that didn't make it in the end. Um, that it pains me that some of them are in there and some of them are not in there. Um, and they're all very important services and important work that needs to happen. But in thinking about restraint, you know, I've held back a lot of things. I think all my colleagues have. Um, and I think to date, to this point, we have shown a lot of restraint on, on a number of pieces, and that that's why we're not here debating lengthy um, additional amendments. Um, you know, there's only two additional increase, and, and I think that, that's, that reflects um, that approach. So I want to maintain that. Second piece, you know, I, I, I hear my colleagues' uh, points about the library has been undergoing reduction measures and cost-saving measures well before the pandemic. Um, and I think in, with some of the ABCs that have come forward, um, I have seen that effort as well. Perhaps not to the same degree, but, you know, in times of challenge, everyone um, is making that effort. And I think thirdly, if it is a signal that, that you're looking for, you know, I would have preferred the mover to have made, to take a sim similar approach as the other ABCs with subsequent motions to provide that signal. Uh, it may not be 100%, but I think it is a consistent approach with all the other um, groups that, that are also requesting very worthy um, causes as well, very important pieces um, as well. So I think for those reasons, I will um, I will maintain the no. You know, I think you know I think there are probably this likely will be supported by by majority of council. But I think I needed to maintain that principle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you to everyone for your thoughts. It's much appreciated. Um, yeah, I was just listening to the debate. It's. Uh, it's always the case in our large budgets that the comparably small parts of our budget tend to get debated the most fiercely. Um, I've, I've never really figured out why that is, but it is. And, uh, you know, the, the library has been practicing what we call OP12 long before there was an OP12. They've always found ways to find more efficiency and ways to stretch our dollars. And I really commend them on that. And it's very rare that they actually come to us with an ask. And it's only when they have a real need. Only when there's a real need. You know, libraries provide something really unique and wonderful. They create a sense of cohesion and community, which is so needed these days. And a place of safety where all are welcomed. So when we're talking about something that has an almost imperceptible impact on our tax rate, but provides so much more than the money represents, 
I'm always in a in a frame of mind to support that. You know, not to let me tell I'm gonna say something very broad, but I'm gonna to try to root it. You know, libraries are often a place where dreams are born. I mean that quite seriously. It's where people who have lost a job often go to find out what they can do next. Right? It's it's where a kid can see new information for the first time in there their imaginations will will soar. For me as a young man, it was one of the, uh, <clears throat> was one of the safe places I could go. And it's there that I found my passion. It's there that the world actually opened up to me. And I could see that I could chart a path that was different from the one that I think the world was telling me was the only one available for me. And I, I feel personally indebted to our city for having libraries, for having a place like that. And I lived in a new area. As a young man, there was uh, there wasn't a lot of services, and I think that there's there may be, and I think about this: if there are people who can access this library, and it will be the first time that they can actually access a library because they may not have great families, they may not have money to get around, then this city is doing something amazing for the coming generation. $449,000 in 2025, $37,000 in 2026 on an ongoing basis. In many ways, I, I feel that I owe my life to libraries and um, our library doesn't ask much in return. Just so we show up. And in this case, I'm going to show up for the library. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, now, Councillor Cartman to close. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So, just want to address a couple of things very quickly. Yes, this goes on the tax levy now. There's an opportunity to either reduce the tax levy in a few months in a corresponding amount or flip the source. The reason this is urgent now is because the library occupies a commercial building. And if you own a commercial building that has empty space, there is unbelievable pressure on you to fill that space. So the owner of that building is going to fill it with anything. And I can almost guarantee that if this doesn't go through today, then the library is getting a new neighbor in the bay next door tomorrow. It will not be there. This opportunity is gone. I too had all kinds of amendments I wanted to make. I had a number of amendments that would have correspondingly reduce the tax levy to accommodate this and accommodate spending on the other ABCs and that kind of I had I had the math and we went through presentations over the last nine days that very clearly warned against making any of those decisions too quickly the only reason I plucked this one this only one is because not the opportunity is gone now and all we have to do is show a commitment for a year from now so that they can carry on. There is growth pressures and this is the most efficient way for this, for the library to meet those growth pressures is by through this, is through this expansion. There is no co-location opportunity coming anytime soon. There's a rec center potentially coming in that neighborhood. It's fifth in the queue. It's decades away. The next co-location is not available. There's no other city thing going down there. So it's this or nothing for a very long time. This does not reduce the pressure on the Riverbend Library. And I want to say, you know, I'm, I am really, really disappointed that the, that the notion of ward-specific uh, motions has leaked into this conversation. This is not in my ward. This is not to benefit my ward. This benefits the 50,000 people that live in Heritage Valley. That's who it benefits. I don't get anything out of this. 
you know, and I and and to say that you only move things because you you benefit as a ward councillor. I'm really disappointed that that has entered this conversation in any way at all. I I too have demonstrated restraint. I too did. I've not moved anything on the Riverbend branch, for instance. I have not moved anything that was specific to my ward. In fact, the only thing I've talked about in my ward is Ambleside Yard, and that conversation was around should we put that off. So the idea that does, that somehow this is of ward benefit or personal benefit, I I find that profoundly disappointing. When I was six years old, I got a story similar to Aaron's, but not the same. We moved to Dickensfield. The recreation center in Dickensfield when I was a kid were the houses under construction around my house. That's where you went to play. Or the commercial buildings that you were under construction. That's where you went to play. The construction sites. There's nothing else there. The first thing that came to Dickensfield was a library. And that began that became the place that I spent my time. When we moved to Castle Downs, same thing. I lived in the north subdivision. There was nothing around. There was mink farms. There was literally farms in, in all four directions. I played in the basement of the Castle Downs Mall when it was under construction. I walked through the lake because that's where you played. That was the only thing that was interesting was the construction sites. And the first thing that was built in Castle Downs was a library. The, re the, the rink didn't come for 30 years. The high school that my family was promised that was going to be built in 1978 might start construction next year. The one constant was the library. The library was what pulled you out of mischief. It was what pulled you out of doing things that you ought not be doing. It was the place you could go for just about anything, not just the books. So, you know, there's a whole lot of kids in Heritage Valley that can't get into that library, that cannot get into the, the play group, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, and can't get into the read-along and can't get a book and can't, they don't have that opportunity. Honestly, you know, to commit to a lease a year from now is the subject of an hour-long debate. I'm really surprised. There's all kinds of opportunities to find these dollars in the spring just like has been promised for something like $240 million of reallocations. This is not a big deal. Let's support this and move on. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, now to... The last one is Councillor Rice. That is Amendment 17. Councillor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, so this amendment is based on the few facts, factors here. Um, our city has significant large amount of green spaces. And for the turf, in, uh, turf maintenance services, our city uh, tries the best and provide the services level um, they could provide it. We still heard and from a public from Edmontonians and also from constituents uh, feedback about the turf maintenance, there is a gap there and for the services to meet the community needs and even to keep our city attractive and active. I think the grass is maintained and from May, May until later fall, uh, there's still some need is not met and in certain uh, area across the entire city. Uh, during the budget deliberation, the city administration provided the presentation and a specific talk about uh, the funding uh, shortfall and then limited the level of services provided. So this motion and is just uh, uh, use the um, same principle or council approved last yesterday and to use ART reserve and to funding $1 million and for 
2024 summer on a one-time basis. Uh, there is no impact on any tax levy. That's all. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair? I have the chair. Can I ask questions now? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, uh, I guess to the mover, we had debated in the multi-part amendment the trim cycle, uh, but through discussion uh, individually and with other council colleagues, you know, it, it, we felt it was preempting a conversation we, we need to have when that turf report comes forward. And that at that point, you know, for example, canceling A1 allows for some flexibility to, to debate that and have that discussion at that time. So I guess I'm just curious, A, why now and not after that that report comes forward and we can fulsom, fulsomely debate our priorities around turf, and B, why this funding source? To the mover. Councillor Rice, can you answer that question, please? Muted. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so, this um, funding resource um, is a carefully considered looking for look at the different available funding resources. Um, so there is one, there is one uh, opportunity um, back to um, Amendment 15, and we talk about the Parks and Road Services Branch and the User ART uh, yeah. reserve. I, I, I guess what I'm asking you is two things. A1 was canceled. We've already approved that in the multi-part amendment. That's $5 million in one-time funding that doesn't require a policy exemption, as an example. So why wouldn't that be considered as the funding source, first and foremost? And B, why are we having this conversation preempting the report from administration to fully discuss the priorities and how we want to see turf going forward? Just concisely those two questions. I, I'm not sure I understand your question fully. I will try my best to answer your question. And because when I put this amendment and with discussion with administration, I didn't receive any like the question regarding why and this amendment is not put at a later time. So to me, I am, the purpose for this motion is very, very simple. And how we can make the situation change and let's do one year to say if this $1 million will make the difference for the level of services and to, to improve that services and to fill the gap and between the community demands and their service level. Uh, but if it's one time, then we set that service expectation yes. without and then we would have to likely do ongoing funding in 2025, which would bring up the tax levy, which I know you've been very vocally concerned about. So how, well, it doesn't affect the tax levy now. Aren't you concerned about the sustainability of this decision? It's not about the sustainability. And then I, I think there are many, many conversations we had in the council. And if we don't know, and for certain sense is work is well, work well, a lot working, and then we do the one-time basis. And I didn't see the reason why we cannot, just based on the needs from the, our Edmontonians to provide these services in one summer to look okay. at. Thank you, just have two quick questions. To the clerk, if this fails, can it still be, can turf and budget still be debated at committee with the report that's coming from administration? Sorry, can you? Yes. And to uh, Mr. Robar, 
what would your preference be? I think it's always the will of council. Obviously, one-time funding is never ideal if we're setting expectations on service uh, priorities for, for citizens and then reducing that at a later date. That would be challenging for city operations. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Councilor Wright? Yeah, my question related to the funding source as well, so maybe I'll ask it in a different way. Um, so to the mover, how does this relate to LRT or, or public transit of any kind? And then, then my question I mean, to you and Councillor Wright, that how many we passed and related to ART reserve? And it's the same question. And if we, that is a funding source available and we can use that funding source to provide different services to meet identity needs. I, I don't think this is really the opportunity the for me to be, for you to be asking me questions. I think it's, it's my opportunity to ask you how does this relate to LRT or public transit? Uh, because the green spaces and including many, many area, and it is in the city's major road. That is part of the parks and the roads branch services they provided. And then that so is- So we would, we would only designate this funding then to trim around bus stops or- uh, we we have bigger scope, and based on what council passed. So it doesn't all it doesn't all relate then to the public transit use. Okay, and that's all I have. Thank you passed. very much. Yeah, it's demonstrated that. Yes. Thank you, Councillor. Right, Councillor Rutherford. Can you take the chair? I have the chair. So do we do we know when will the report be coming to uh, committee for discussion on the turf maintenance? Yeah, it's coming in January. January, right? And that report possibly give us different options, different service standards, and what are resources are required to meet those service standards. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And you would prefer to have, and I, <laughs> I remember this is you no know, an ICE debate, right, where we allocate one-time funding, then we had to cut it, and that created a lot of confusion among public, and we took a lot of flack for that right, as, as a council too, right? So this reminds me that conversation that, uh, that if we, if we allocate one-time funding without committing to ongoing funding, what happens come December 2024, right? Yeah, those service levels will decrease back to where they were before the funding. And how likelihood is that you'll be able to hire people just on a one-year commitment, right? Or even create uncertainty for workers, like hiring somebody for one year without you know, giving certainty about future employment with the city. Yeah, it would build upon the temporary workforce that we had talked about previously. Right, right. But it'll be just temporary one one year without knowing whether you can sustain them for long term. That's correct. And we'd be renting equipment as well, just not knowing that we have permanent funding. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so my question, Councillor uh, Rice, to you is, uh, shouldn't we wait till January and then... Um, we will have a very robust discussion in uh, in April before we set the mill rate. I think that gives us a couple of months to contemplate on uh, on a more sustainable long term ongoing funding for this very important service instead of just one time funding. Then not knowing whether we'll be able to find sustained funding. Uh, Mayor Sohin, that is the council majority wants that. I have no problem. So the only concern is when the report come back to January, yeah. at that moment, and do we have the available funding source to allocate to contribute to the ongoing basis? So by, for this motion, at least we can ensure the one summer to look at and how this service level will meet the needs from Edmontonians. So yeah. I don't mind to withdraw, but I just say that is my concern. And when the uh, report come back January 15th. Yeah, I, I would suggest that for a robust conversation to take place and funding sources to be sustainable, that we have that this discussion in January. So if you're okay to withdraw this, right, uh, uh, I, I, then probably we, then we can have, actually have a permanent solution to a problem that you're trying to solve, which is absolutely a problem that we need to solve. Are you yeah, okay? I'm okay. okay. Chair? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Return the chair. 
Okay, I'll I'll return. Uh, I'll take the chair back. Okay, so Councillor Rice is going to withdraw this uh, this motion. Is that okay? everyone okay? Seems to be okay. All right, so that is done. Well, we're done with amendments. Okay, it's ten forty one. Uh, so we concluded capital amendments. We concluded operating amendments. And we will vote separately on capital and operating, but we will speak once to both of those those amendments, those motions on the floor. One is on the floor, but the other one. So which one, which one should be on the floor at this time before we start speaking? Does it matter? So the, they're both going to be on the floor at the same time. Okay. So and can, can we put because at yeah. this time it's only operating. So can we put both on the floor now? We can. Okay. And I just want to uh, what we would want to do just before you actually do the vote, we're going to take those emotions off the floor and we're going to put a recommendation on to add a revised attachment one, which will include all the amendments that have passed related to the operating budget, just so that it's really clear and transparent. We'll have that ready to go before you vote. Okay. You'll okay. You'll have that ready. Uh, okay, before we vote, but we don't need to take a break then for for you to do that or no? I I'm not seeing any waving hands from our friends to the right, so I think we'll be ready to go. And council absolutely understands what those amendments were, so we know we are yep. going to be speaking to right. So, all right. So okay, well we can start speaking. All right, we can open up, I can open up, sorry. Mayor, I was wondering if we could just, um, so part of the uh, agreement on the police funding formula is because any any amendments that go up or down relating to civic departments can generate a change. There is a small adjustment that we need to do with uh, the EPS funding formula. It's minor, but I don't know, I don't think we necessarily need a motion for that, do we? No, or do we need the amendment? Yeah, why don't, could you just give us five minutes? Just give us so five minutes. Okay, we'll take a five-minute break then. We'll it's, a, it's, a, it's a very small adjustment, we'll but we just want to make sure break. we're doing it right.
Okay, we are back and we'll start with the roll call. Consular Wright. Good, uh, good morning. Consular Nack. Good morning. Consular Prince Bay. Hello. Consular Stevenson. Good morning. Consular Paquette. Good morning. Consular Tang. Good morning. Consular Hamilton. Good morning. Consular Rutherford. Good morning. Consular Salvador. Hello. Consular Cartmel. Good morning. Consular Hello. Rice. And Consular Jans. Good morning. All right, everyone is here. So can you give us a little bit quick update on the uh, the attachment that has been created? So you will have a revised attachment one, which includes all of the amendments that have passed. Uh, added to that will be a slight adjustment to the Edmonton Police Funding Formula recalculation. It is minor. It goes up by $50,000 in 2024 and down by 129000 in 2025. Uh, it doesn't have any impact on the tax levy because it is a very small adjustment. So where you will land is 2024 will be 6.6%, 2025 will be 5.3%, 2026 will be 4.7%, and that changes your average cost per day to $8.71. Thank you so much for that. Okay. All right, now to speak. Council colleagues, please sign up to speak to, I'm oh, sorry, you have quest process question? Just one question. How are we to that threshold limit of 30%? We are, I believe, slightly below still with this at 30. Like, if they're getting, they're getting their full allotment with the exception of those couple minor adjustments. So we'd be right at the 30. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson, process question or? Do we need to on the move the motion to add the replacement, the, the attachment? Yeah, okay, okay, I can move that. Okay, please. Um, that replacement attachment one be added to item 5.2, fall 2023 supplemental operating budget adjustment 2023 to 2026 operating budget, and that it include the Edmonton Police Service funding formula recalculation. Okay, need second. a second, second by Councillor Tang. Okay, all right, now to speak, right? Or... We are adding the attachment. I'm so eager. <laughs> Please vote to you speak to this and not everything. <laughs> Please vote to add an attachment to. <laughs> yeah, to add an attachment. <laughs> okay. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, please. Everyone, everyone voted? We are just missing two votes and just missing one vote. I, I didn't say on my screen. I... Councillor Rice, may I have a verbal vote? Okay. I mean, yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Okay, display the votes, please. That is Gary. Now we are ready to speak, right? Okay. Now, colleagues, please sign up to speak. Can you show that on the uh, on the screen the uh, the motion for both capital and operating is possible? Yes, we're getting that on the screen please. for you. Please bear with us. We are just experiencing slight technical difficulties. Okay, Councillor Salvador, you want to start? Sure. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, and maybe I'll just start by thanking the mayor and his team for helping develop the multi-part motion that encompasses a number of key priorities uh, like public transit while making strategic reductions in order to minimize the tax impact. 
really appreciate all the work that went into collaborating with council to develop motions, which have helped us balance our priorities in this very challenging budget adjustment. Also just want to thank administration for all the work that went into preparing the adjustment. Throughout the adjustment, I think council has exercised restraint and discipline while still investing in core programs, services, and infrastructure that Edmontonians expect to see as our city continues to grow. And we are growing, as a number of us have pointed out, quite dramatically. The pressures and costs of that growth are very real, and we're seeing that reflected across the organization. Uh, bus service, for example, uh, has been chronically underfunded for many years, and service has been stretched thin. And this year, we're taking important steps to reverse that trend. By redeploying the Valley Line Southeast hours and investing in a satellite facility, we're making a timely investment that is our only realistic opportunity between now and the opening of the new transit garage in 2030 to increase service for Edmontonians. And it's these kinds of investments that have compounding benefits. Public transit not only gets people where they need to go from a transportation perspective, but it's a vehicle for economic growth, prosperity, equity, access, and climate action. And of course, it has citywide benefits. And this is just one example of the pressures that we're facing related to growth, uh, but we see it when it comes to things like snow clearing, horticulture, recreation, libraries. Uh, one of my primary concerns continues to be our ability to maintain the public amenities and infrastructure that Edmontonians know and love in the face of those ongoing growth pressures, uh, let alone supporting uh, new infrastructure and projects. And I think at a high level, city plan will help us course correct towards a more fiscally sustainable place. Uh, but thinking about some of the things that, uh, that didn't make it into the ad adjustment, um, you know, I was disappointed that we were unable to move forward with other tools like a dedicated renewal fund that would have helped us start closing that gap. Um, and that's just one of many uh, compromises that, that councillors are, are having to make um, in a challenging adjustment like this one. And when I think about other compromises, I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, a number of us, myself included, were, were starting from a place of compromise um, because of the significant portion of the increase associated with the police funding formula decision. Um, but that being said, I, I respect that that was a council decision. I think council has a responsibility to move forward in good faith and, and that's what I'm fully prepared to do and I would expect others who, who champion that to, uh, to stand behind those decisions as well. When I think of other compromises, um, I think about the many worthy asks and budget requests that are not included in the, this adjustment, but I'm optimistic that through OP12 and future adjustments, we'll be able to find room to accommodate uh, those core important needs. So maybe just in closing, this budget for me is a reflection of the very real pressures the city is facing right now. It strikes a balance in keeping the increase as low as it can be without compromising our ability to deliver the core services, programs, and infrastructure Edmontonians expect and that will attract and retain people for years to come. Uh, so I will be supporting this and would encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, so last year was the, the four-year budget and I did not support capital or operating. So I feel compelled to explain um, perhaps why this is different. This is a budget adjustment. So we're not relitigating last year's debates, the haves and have, not, have nots, the things that we didn't see that we would have liked to see. This is building off of the base of the capital and operating budget uh, is the sort of proposed amendments to the budget or the proposed um, uh, additions uh, sound and reasonable and importantly defensible. So we started at just over 7% and what's driving us uh, collectively up from last year's budget is wage pressures and inflation. And while inflation is slowing, no doubt we will continue to see wage pressures uh, as, as we catch up um, with the growth that's happened over the last number of years. Um, and this is something I think that's uh, every order of government is impacted by, but municipalities are specifically sensitive to um, because we have so few levers by which to address um, things that are out largely outside of our control. Um, I, 
so, so given that, I'm glad to see sort of where reductions have been made and applied to the budget and that where there are increases, it's getting back to, I think, the, the values of core services and the impacts that people will see in their neighborhoods, such as transit growth, um, bringing the snow clearing a little bit ironically, uh, I'll say, up uh, to that, that um, service level that, that we previously had. And libraries are a specifically a library um, in a neighborhood that is desperately in need um, of, of seeing that uh, sort of capacity expanded. So, um, and, and the capital budget only sees, I think, the corresponding growth with the, the buses. Um, so while, uh, you know, I think we'd all like to see perhaps the tax levy number a little bit lower, the leap from 4.96 to 6.6, .6, I think where we ended up is, is reasonable and defensible and, and I can support that change. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this budget adjustment was, was hard and it felt to me at times just as hard as last year's four-year budget. And even though this was a budget adjustment year, there was a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to balance the budget given the many constraints City Council and Edmontonians are facing this year. I wanna focus on three areas. Number one, we are growing as a city. That's not a surprise. And the cost rises for the city parallels that for households. We are catching up after years of belt tightening, constant below inflation tax increases, and we continue to face difficult financial decisions. Similarly, I want to thank the mayor for putting forward the multi-part amendment and him and his team's efforts for collaboration and finding shared priorities from council. From what is proposed and what is not, we focus on the most critical items, maintaining and expanding inventory and reinforcing some much needed services. Public transportation, a big emphasis on public safety, frontline delivery, things that I believe how to make our city better for all, services that Edmontonians expect and rely on, and ones that in war got a heal, I continue to hear from my residents are important. These are services Edmontonians will see on our streets and feel the impact of. And not too dissimilar to last year's four-year budget, there were a lot of important items that came forward that were also not funded. And we will continue to explore opportunities in upcoming years and through advocacy with other levels of government. Secondly, I hear from residents about how challenging a tax increase is with our current economic climate and the pressures of affordability that everyone is facing. I think about this a lot and do not take your contributions to our city and this discussion lightly. Similar to households, the city is also facing impacts from inflation, from supply chain and labor force issues, from rising interest rates, utility and construction costs. With the increases set in this budget adjustment, property taxes will come out to be about $8.71 a day for a typical household. I wanna focus a little bit on what do you get for that money? You get 70 lines of businesses. And even if you think you don't use a lot of it, you're likely encountering city services all day long the roads we drive on, the neighborhood sidewalks, green spaces and parks. We have some fantastic libraries and rec centers with growing usage, emergency services, public safety, waste collections. 70 lines of, uh, of services that make our city run and remain competitive in this global market. And thirdly, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the workers who provide much of these frontline services I just mentioned, and many more who work behind the scenes to support them. Having spent time in, in administration previously, I've seen the dedication and commitment to community from my colleagues day in and day out. Since being elected, my office and, and I are constantly working with administration to resolve concerns, questions, issues that come from residents and businesses alike in Ward Garejio. And I am constantly awed by the level of professionalism, the in-depth due diligence, the care and compassion our city staff members show to every single issue, however small or big. And so for $8.71 a day for a household, the quality of service matters. And we wanted to make sure that we don't erode that quality. Can we do better? Absolutely. Last year, we initiated this exercise called OP12 to review shifting funding towards frontline services over the next three years. This work is vital and I want to see it being diligently pursued and continued by our city manager and his teams. 
Our city staff do great work each and every day. They keep our city running and there are places where we can make improvements and efficiencies, close policy gaps, bolster our frontline services that people depend on and ensure that there is a good return on investment for each dollar spent. For these reasons, I support this budget adjustment. Across the country, like my colleague mentioned, we are seeing trends in financial hardships facing municipalities and the unsustainability of simply relying on property tax base to provide service to an ever-growing population and often in areas that are not in our typical wheelhouse. And this is why more than ever, we need to strengthen our relationships with the provincial and federal governments, particularly when it comes to fiscal frameworks that govern and, and can potentially address the growing challenges we face as municipalities. Thank you, Councilor Tank. Uh, Councilor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I would like to also thank uh, my colleagues and administration for all the hard work, city clerk's office. Amazing work, well done. Uh, I, this is a really tough uh, budget amendment session. And uh, although I voted against several amendments, overall, with the uh, council-supported amendments, we will be seeing a decrease in the tax levy from 7.09% to 6.6%. And we will be contributing to uh, better better uh, life for Edmontonians, I believe. So for that reason, I, I will be supporting the operational uh, budget adjustment, but I will not be supporting the capital because the amendment that I had brought forward was not successful. That is the main reason that I will not be supporting the capital budget. I would prefer, uh, I, I, but I will be supporting the operational budget. And I do want everyone to know that it doesn't end here. We still have this spring SOBA coming forward and there's an opportunity for us uh, through the OP12 exercise and as well as um, spring SOBA to, to still possibly see a reduction in the tax levy. So it doesn't end here. I just want people to know that. And yeah, thank you for giving me my time to speak. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I think it goes without saying, because I don't say it often enough, but thank you to administration for putting this all together. And thank you to my council colleagues for coming to a, a consensus on, um, on what we have before us. Um, I know we, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, what's in the multi-part motion and that, but I'd also like to acknowledge um, what was put in a, a, as funded, and that being the anti-racism office. I think in light of the conflicts that are going on in our world today, um, I think it's even more important now to have, um, to have this so that we can all work together, sorry, to make this a better city. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Principe's concern in regards to debt servicing. Uh, when, I, when I used to, when I used to do credit training, we used to talk about uh, good debt and bad debt. Um, so I think good debt is something that you can, that you're getting benefit from in the long run. And I think a lot of these capital projects um, that we are now having to service um, helps to maintain the infrastructure in our city, um, our roads and other shared pathways, um, our facilities, we're looking at renewal of some of these facilities and I think that's a good thing. Um, so these were decisions made in the past, and and but I think they were um, overall, you know, looking forward to the future and and making that a uh, making that good debt to be servicing at this time. Um, I know um, some of the other increases um, relate to our our staff, and not only our civic employees but our also our police services, and I think that 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 funding uh, is needed in order to provide the programs and services that Edmontonians expect and, and, and rely on. So um, I, again, I think, you know, we're, we're putting funds in the right direction. Um, and we've all, all municipalities have experienced um, a drop in our funding sources as well. And as Councillor Hamilton pointed out, we only have a few levers with which to, to draw upon. Um, and, and one of them, and the, the main one, I guess, is our, our property taxpayers. Um, so, you know, per, given 
given what each property taxpayer is paying, the value that they get for those dollars, um, I think is being, um, is, is well used. Um, we focused here on priority areas such as public transportation um, and some of those other core services. So across the board, I, I think everybody can, can see value from their property taxes. Um, there's also programs for our seniors um, uh, that the province has. Uh, if they need to help manage their finances, they can also draw upon the, uh, the seniors' property tax deferral program. So I just wanted to, to mention that as well, that there's, there's options for, for those seniors on the fixed incomes. Um, all in all, thank you very much. It's been a, a good process this time around, I think. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. You know, I've, I've been feeling this sense of, you know, uh, a long period of time where, where some balls have been kind of kicked down, kicked down the road. And what I really feel that we're, we're hitting uh, at this budget process is the end of that, that road. Uh, cost pressures, growth, um, eroding service levels uh, means we really can't uh, punt things any further, uh, which leaves us at a bit of a crossroads. Uh, and I am, I am pretty excited how, how our budget uh, is starting to, to reflect that. So I think, you know, the capital budget, there's as much um, to, to be proud of in terms of what's not in there as much as there is what, what is in there. We're really starting to see that needed refocus and shift towards renewal rather than growth. Um, and, and as we start to make strategic shifts to reduce the need for new infrastructure in the future, so I'm so thrilled with the, both the capital and operating investments we've been able to make in transit. Um, this will support Edmontonians in so many different ways, but, but particularly in, a, in affordability and providing a range of mobility options. Uh, I also really appreciate uh, the resources that have been committed to our encampment response. Encampments have significant impact on all Edmontonians, um, including both those who, who don't have other shelter options that meet their needs as well as surrounding residents and businesses. The resources we've approved will allow us to continue to focus on safety and, and minimizing risk um, and addressing the cleanup that, that is needed. These aren't long-term solutions, but they are critical responses to the houseless crisis that we're facing right now. Uh, having spoken at the beginning about the importance of not kicking the cans down the road, uh, I do appreciate that we're doing that to a small extent. Uh, we've decided as a council to defer some of our other decisions to the spring, which is not that far. Um, but I think it, it makes a lot of sense. We'll have much greater clarity on our own financial position uh, and as well as the opportunities we've identified through OP12. You know, I think I I feel very optimistic about that exercise. And I, you know, there's part of me that felt ready to commit uh, to some of those reallocations at this point. Um, but I think it is prudent as we've collectively decided to wait until we have uh, greater clarity and, and solidity on those decisions before committing. Um, but as fair warning to my colleagues, there are a number of priorities that were highlighted in the unfunded service packages that I do look forward to bringing forward in the spring, um, including ongoing maintenance of trees, temporary and seasonable workforce expansion, um, and of course, traffic safety teams. But that is all for a conversation to come. Uh, so for now, I just want to express my deep gratitude to uh, everyone on city staff. I mean, we've had the team, the core team here working on the budget. What I've been really blown away by is just all of the different um, staff who are so passionate about their areas of work, who, who know um, their service levels inside and out and have been able to answer uh, so many questions throughout these deliberation processes and in advance. I uh, also want to, again, share my thank you uh, for the mayor's office and the work that he did, um, along with all of my colleagues as well. So I look forward to supporting this budget adjustment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to speak, but I just want to be brief about a few things that I haven't heard others say thus far. Um, I mean, everybody has, has said, yay, that we got it down to 6.6 .6 from 7.09. I, I would still say that 6.6 .6 is not ideal. Um, and I'd like to remind that the phase out of the tax subclass adds another 0.3% to uh, residential this year in 2024. Um, 
but I've also heard that a lot of the, the messages in my inbox say, it's easy to just raise taxes. But I say to you, it is not easy to just raise taxes. This is a very, very difficult choice. And it's one that takes courage because this is about making decisions for Edmonton on in the long sustainable future, regardless of election cycles. That is the decision we are making today. Um, yes, it's just an adjustment, but it's an adjustment that added police funding formula, which is something we all heard was important. I didn't agree with the methodology of the formula, but I don't think anybody debates that the police needed more resources to help with some of the, the pressures that we're feeling in our city. It's utility increases. We, we thought that's something we can just turn off the lights and say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have lighting, we're not gonna have heating in our facilities. Uh, you know, we have to address those cost pressures and it's revenue shortfall that we have time over the next, you know, four months to figure out either on our expenditure side or our revenue side, how we can bring that down further. Um, I know that we are going to make that hard decision today, but we're also committed. I've heard, I've, I'm heartened by my colleagues, um, you know, in, in terms of wanting to really grapple with some of those hard decisions we know we're going to have to make in 2024. And yes, we all have priorities and priorities that reflect the people that we represent, but our, the people that we represent are not homogenous. And, you know, I think you, you need to look no further than the active mode infrastructure to see very diverse perspectives on, on how we and what we invest in as a city. We're talking about an adjustment in the context of growth and inflationary pressures. And I appreciate that we have been more restrained because one of the things that I worried about was getting too thin in our flexibility in terms of our uh, financial strategies or our FSR and putting us and the corporation at greater risk for even bigger uh, budget adjustments down the road. So I feel like we've struck a really great balance in this adjustment of both um, finding savings and creating some cushion still whilst also moving forward with things that we know are really important and not leaning into austerity. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I think that that is one of the biggest reasons that I, I was compelled to run for city council was I saw how tough this budget was gonna be and boy, it's been a reality of just how actually tough it is because I knew it was gonna be tough but this is like 10 times tougher than I even thought it was gonna be. Um, but I knew that there would be an, uh, an inclination to lean towards cuts that can hurt. Um, and, and so I'm proud that myself and my colleagues find, have found a path forward in a very hard budget to, um, to make sure that we cut where we need to, but we also invest where we need to. And to those that, you know, asked for adjustments and amendments in this budget that don't see their amendments or their adjustments in the budget, I want to say to you that we hear you well, well, we will be having those hard conversations and decisions, and we do have a lot of competing priorities, but I do want you to know that you are not unseen and that, that we know that, those, that your work and the work that you do is very important to Edmontonians as well. And so please do not see the lack of that reflected in a budget adjustment to your organization or to, to the areas that you serve as a sign of our lack of caring or compassion for that. And lastly, in the 20 seconds I have less left, I wanna just again, thank the collaborative nature. I know right now there's conversations going on about uh, partisan politics, but I think this is an example clearly today of when we come together, when we work together, when we don't have partisan lines to draw, the great work that we can have, that can happen collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cardmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So I wanna, you know, I, I, oh, I went and lost my notes. I'm going to, uh, on 30 seconds on the bike lanes, I uh, asked questions and we heard that roughly $2 million has been spent planning the bike lanes. So that for me meant that there was modest risk if we reconsidered at least some of that funding, that 
we would not be undoing projects that have been committed to, that we wouldn't have to retract uh, proposal calls that were out there. So this was an opportunity to reconsider some or all of that funding. That motion was made, it was offered, it was defeated. So, and, and that in essence was a reconsideration motion and I have been critical of reconsideration motions in the past. So I'm going to suggest that at this point, conversation's over. The $100 million is going to bike lanes and just like the LRT projects we're building that not everybody loves, it's time to move on from this. So my pledge to you is to move on from this. It's time to, to get on with the next set of conversations. I wanted to thank administration for their work over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the, the presentation we got, the first 20 minutes we got last Tuesday morning really set the context of where we are. And the conversation we had, um, was that just yesterday, albeit mostly in private, uh, was sobering. And I, I thank them for that. I want to call attention to this, that we really started this process at eight and three quarter percent tax increase. And, and the, I will go into the feedback that I've received in a minute, but one of the feedback points was, you know, we always start high and we chisel away at it and then we self-congratulate ourselves as heroes for getting it down. Administration didn't play that game. They could have landed here with an eight and three quarter percent uh, budget increase and said, you know, good luck. They didn't. They took it down to 7.1 as best they could and we have since chiseled away at that. So for the part of this conversation that is about the, the amendment, that is about the increase, that is about what has happened in the last year, I'm very supportive of that. We're talking about um, roughly a 1.6% in-year increase that speaks to police budgeting, that speaks to um, unforeseen salary pressures. Uh, and what we're getting for it is additional transit service, which is a, a, something I hear about a lot. We're getting uh, encampment treatments, which is something I hear about a lot. And we're not losing that with those police funding dollars. I will say on the police funding that the capital maintenance did not get questioned. The uh, funding formula was not questioned or reconsidered. Uh, the salary increases are there. So I really hope we start seeing some results because that's the next step in this public safety equation is that it's time to move forward, to stop looking back at some of the rhetoric that might have been uh, criticized, that might have been demoralizing, and to start moving forward, all of us together, in support of our police service, get, now that they have all the tools they have essentially asked for. The other part of this budget, 6.6 .6 is not a great number. It, it is not a number I have comfort with. It is not something I support. It is not something I endorse. We've had a very clear discussion and agreement here that we are going to effectively, as Councillor Stevenson said, kick the can down the road a few months and have a conversation about a, a potential further reduction, about potential reallocation built upon the work of OP12, which came out of the budget conversation last year. I'm still not happy about the budget conversation last year and I am not happy that we have not seen particular results from the OP12 exercise yet. I understand we've had a lot on our plate, but time's run out, patience has run out. It is time for this budget to start modeling what people expect. And right now it doesn't. And whether that's through reallocations or reductions or uh, other methods, the spring SOBA is, is deadline day. That is where we're gonna actually have to see some of these things take root and see an effect for what people expect from us. I've heard from people that have given back feedback. I have said the same thing myself. 7%, 6.6% is one thing. 6.6% with modest increases in some services and big losses in others, it's not acceptable. We need to reallocate. And I have heard the refrain, I have heard the undertone from administration that any further move is a reduction in service lines or a reduction in service levels. Yes, it is. Yes, it absolutely is. These are the hard conversations that are ahead of us and it's time to face them head on and start making some firm decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Cartmel. Anyone else to speak? No. Uh, they're both. Very close, okay. Okay. That's that's a new privilege I have now. Okay. Okay. 
Or Councilor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. So, uh, similar to Councilor Hamilton, uh, you know, I acknowledge well, and, and miss just the point of I see Michael Jans on the board. Yeah, we'll come to. Don't worry, but uh, uh, we'll come to that too. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Councilor Nag, go ahead, please. Try so we'll start your time. I need my again. six seconds back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, start with again a, a big thank you to everyone in city administration for the work. I know it is never easy. I've gone through many and many, many of these, and, and the amount of time and effort you put into it is is greatly appreciated. Um, similar to Councilor Hamilton, you know, I, I I acknowledge not not to try to like score political points, I didn't support the operating budget, and I appreciate that I didn't support it last time, and I'm going to support this, and I want to explain why. Um, because similar to what Councilor Rutherford mentioned, any decision to uh, support a tax increase is not an easy one. I've still never met an elected representative that is happy to increase taxes. Um, and, and we know that every increase in cost that people are facing right now is having a real impact on the folks uh, and the lives of the people that we serve. And they're seeing cumulative increases in so many different areas right now. And we know the same increases are being felt by municipalities across the country. This is, Edmonton is not unique in the conversation happening right now. This is happening in small and large municipalities across the country. And, you know, I think about what happened in the last budget cycle, not, not the one last year, but the 2019 to 2022 budget, where we made a decision, and a very conscious decision, to have taxes go up 2.6% in 2019, 1.3% uh, in 2020, a freeze in 2021, and 1.9% uh, in 2021, uh, one, sorry, uh, in 2022. Those were the lowest increases that we have seen in 25 years. And we made a conscious decision to do that, and we knew that that would create cost pressures um, because inflation continues to go up. A lot of folks here are talking about growth. I'm going to use, I'm going to focus on growth in one specific area, which is just the sheer number of people. In the last two years, 70,000 people have moved into the city of Edmonton. That's a 7% pop, uh, population increase. That is an increase that would make, if that was a new city built today, would be the sixth largest city in Alberta. And the majority of them, because the city plan is not yet fully enacted yet, uh, the majority of them are moving into new areas where we need to build new roads and new utilities and new fire halls. Thankfully, those are covered through offsite levies. But then new police stations, new rec centers, new libraries, new parks, and we need to maintain it all. And we know that we don't make money on new residential development. And when you have that sheer volume of people moving, that kind of growth we haven't seen in a very long time, and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, we are, even with this increase we're talking about, Edmonton is still by far and away the most affordable major city in all of Canada, and we're going to continue to attract large numbers of people every year. And that is going to have a huge impact on the cost that we have to operate our city. So that's something that I'm thinking about a lot when we're having this conversation today in the adjustment. And so for me, why I, I think about supporting this, because truly to some of the other points I heard Councilor Carmel itemize some of the lists, it would be hy uh, hypocritical of me to vote no to this having supported virtually every amendment and everything that we've talked about in the last year for the additional amount that we're talking about. Uh, so, so, and those are the things that have been brought up by residents over and over and over again in the town halls that I've hosted, in the emails I've gotten, the calls I've received. So I really feel that uh, it, it just there, there's no way I could, in good conscience, vote, vote against this and then look all of you in the eye, <laughs> noting that it was very hard last year to vote no. Uh, <laughs> last year, I think I spoke first and I broke down and was blubbering, I think, through most of the five minutes because I, I had never voted against an operating budget. And it was actually... Normally it's easy. I do appreciate it. usually voting against the budget is easy, um, but that was actually really hard having never done that before and feeling like I was letting, letting folks down um, because the work that has gone into this has been pretty substantive. So, so I just want to really appreciate all my colleagues for the work that you've done uh, to get to where we're at today and, and for all of your great comments. I'll, I'll leave the last 45 seconds echoing Councillor Cartmel's piece, which is that I, I am very concerned about OP12. Um, I think even if in the most generous of definitions right now where I would incorporate the EPCOR dividend into OP12, from an operating perspective, the math I think I've done is that we've found a total of about 33 million of the 240 million target. And if we're even using the cumulative de definition, 
by the end of next year, we would need $100 million to make up the rest if we actually wanted to hit $240 million. This is an all of us exercise. I'm not just putting this on a min. This is on council. We got to hold, but like we need a lot and we need a lot very quick and we need to do our part. We need administration support because otherwise we will not be able to fund any of the other things that are talked about that are very critical. So I'm going to support this with that caution in the back of my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, um, I'm glad that Councillor Nag uh, pointed out uh, what the tax rates were. I remember in 2020 when it was 1.8, and I got lots of emails from people saying tax rate is just too high. In 2021, when it was 0%, I got a lot of emails saying the tax rate is just too high. It should be negative. And in 2022, when it was 1.8, decided by this council, Again, I got emails saying it's way too high. The point is that it doesn't matter what the tax rate is. People are people are not going to like it. People don't like paying taxes. It's that simple. And I get it because there's sort of a, a horrible kind of truth here. When we reduce taxes to 1.8 and zero, and, oh, sorry, in 2020 it was 1.3. I've got that wrong. In 1.30 1. 1. and 1.8, what happened is that service was slashed because city budgets aren't padded. We budget for what the year is going to be, and that's the tax rate. That's it. There's no extra. The only extra is the things that are legally mandated to be there and that are prudent, like the FSR and financial strategies, things like that. So it's a very lean proposition when we talk about city budgets. When the tax rates were so low, they did not keep up with inflation and they did not keep up with population growth. And so as people are paying their taxes, they look around, they see their decreased services and they're like, what am I paying my taxes for if I have no services? And then they get mad because their taxes are high. So councils who absolutely do not want to raise taxes look for ways to cut, cut, cut. So the taxes aren't too high and services continue to decline. That's a spiral that is difficult to get out of. In this budget, as was stated, administration could have come forward with above 8%, which would include all the things that uh, we are hoping to see. It came in at 7.1, I believe it is. Here we are at 6.6, six, and then we're talking about seeing if we can get even lower before the final decision is made in the, in the spring. We still will not be keeping up with inflation or with population growth. Now, the silver lining here is that Edmontonians experienced a bus network redesign a couple of years ago. That's been analyzed. Uh, the data has been brought in. And with the mayor's motion, there is going to be an increase in transit service. I believe for the first time since 2015. And that was the promise of BNR, and that promise is being fulfilled now. So my caution, I suppose, is that as we work to keep taxes low, after multiple years of not keeping up with inflation and population growth, the delta between where we would be if, and by the way, that formula is for maintaining. It's not for adding. The delta between those grows ever further. And administration is doing its darndest to keep up with that widening gap. And so we will have to have some serious conversations moving forward, especially in the context of OP12, of what services the city of Edmonton expects and versus what can be provided versus what we want to pay for. So it's important to also point out um, specifically, Calgary came in at 7.8. Looks like Saskatoon is going to come in at 7.14. Vancouver is coming in at 7.6 after last year being, I think, upwards of 10. In the grander scheme of things, Edmonton coming at 6.6 .6 is great. And as has been stated, there may be work yet to do. 
But in the meantime, I think that uh, we need to really have these very frank and uh, very plain conversations with the people of Edmonton about their tax dollars, where they go, and what they get out of it. And um, I believe that I'm actually very hopeful that we're going to have some great conversations about that uh, in the near future. Um, there's so much more to say. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your leadership on this. And thank you to Council. And especially thank you to administration for all your hard work. Thank you, Councilor Pegas. Councilor Jans. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I think my colleagues have made a lot of good points. Uh, one point that hasn't been touched on, though, is just the broader context of treating Edmontonians fairly in the province of Alberta. I was reading just now on the Alberta government website that Alberta is on course to record a $2.4 billion surplus. $2.4 billion surplus at the end of 2023-2024, despite an unprecedented wildfires, wildfire season and ongoing economic volatility. This is $94 million higher than forecast in 2023. Then I'm mindful that since 2019, our budget, Edmonton's budget, has lost over $60 million um, because of photo radar. Losing the $22.3 million in photo radar in 2019 meant that we had to go to the Edmonton taxpayer to generate that money to backfill the police. So Edmontonians are paying higher taxes because of this uh, arbitrary decision by the province in 2019, now renewed. Now compound for me very quickly, 2019 to 2025, $22 million a year. There goes our budget situation right there. Okay, fine, even if it was in half. Let's talk about property taxes and how important it is to pay your property taxes. In 2019, the government of Alberta reduced its grant payments by 25%. In 2020, a further 25% reduction, a total, so total of 50% reduction, which means that the province of Alberta has not been paying their property taxes to Edmonton. Uh, this has resulted in a total revenue loss of over $60 million since 2019 and an operating revenue loss in 2023 of $13.2 million. That's 0.7% of a tax increase right there. Again, compound for me, over the four years, again, our budget decisions go away. Um, say what you want about Justin Trudeau, but at least the federal government pays their property taxes. Next, I want to talk about the other elements of downloading. Now, 70% of medical calls are being responded to by our fire department. Why is AHS not paying the bill and paying their fair share. Of our social work, uh, the police service, Chief Dale McPhee himself says, 30% of the calls are social work. So if you add up again, the call, the downloading from the provincial government on these non, you, these indirect costs, it gets even higher and higher. Very quickly, we could be at a 0% tax increase. In fact, we could be at a negative percent tax increase. If the provincial government paid even just crumbs of that surplus towards Edmontonians. So yet again, why, when you look at these different pieces, why are Edmontonians being treated differently than other Albertans? Why is it that if your postal code is T6G223, that you have to pay more property taxes for living in Edmonton? It's just not fair, and it's been allowed to happen, and that has to stop. So we're not asking for a special deal, just asking for a fair deal, and we can't keep going on nickel and diming each other about do we cut the grass twice or do we cut the grass three times while our province is swimming in surplus and we're not getting our fair share of it. So it's incredibly frustrating here. It doesn't matter who's in government. These problems go back generations, but um, they're worsening. And uh, when, you, when you look at all of the challenges that Edmontonians are raising, whether it's, it's, it's encampments in, in, in the valley, encampments on the streets, whether it's the suffering in our streets, whether it's, it's the, the crumbling infrastructure, um, there comes a point when we have to say, enough is enough, the province needs to pay their fair share. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, thank you, and for this decision point and the lot of effort and from my colleagues and from uh, state administration to get to this point. So last year for the budget, capital and operating, I voted both low to them. But this year, when you look at the budget and even look at the budget 
discussion. I'm very happy to see one piece. We don't have too much debate and we really have, have the agreement on. I think that is public safety piece. That's public safety piece is significant refract in this budget. And then I heard my colleagues, everyone supports that. That is our uh, EPS piece and formula and also salary statement. So that is a very good message to send to our Edmontonians. We care about our Edmontonians safety. That is a very good message to send to the public. Um, in terms right now, at 6.6%, Yes, it's lower than original proposed 7.09%. Uh, and also lack of work, lots of discussion, lots of debate to get to this point. And also I heard uh, we still have opportunity in the spring budget adjustment time and bring this down. So I'm a little bit concerned about this because I do not want to leave the false hope to the Edmontonians. And with the following six months, say we are going to find different funding sources, we will bring this tax down more than 6.6%. I'd rather to see some concrete reduction strategy implemented and into this final tax rate. And specifically, and like I mentioned yesterday when I was speaking to my amendment, uh, I did invite my constituents to share their thoughts and inputs uh, regarding our city's budget because this is Edmonton's budget, is their tax dollars. I received a lot, lot of email. To me, the concern and from what I heard, and it still is not really clear between the line and for our cities, program services, between the line about must have or nice to have. That is one thing. Another thing is about the clear line and between the one and the needs. The message I received, and this line needs to be more clear. So to me, I'm here to vote for my constituents and also to represent the best interests of Edmontonians. And from what I heard, and also from in the past month's engagement, and with the communities and with Edmontonians here. So I'm I'm not going to support this budget. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Ace. Councillor uh, Rutherford, can you take I the have chair. chair. Thank you. I want to start by thanking Edmontonians for entrusting in us the uh, ability to make decisions that uh, uh, are good for the city, and we try to make those decisions with uh, due diligence and uh, and best advice from uh, from administration. Uh, I also want to thank our city employees. Twelve thousand people who work for this city make this city run each and every day. Without them, our city would not be what it is today. So, I really want to convey my deepest appreciation to them. And also to council colleagues for another incredible collaborative approach to uh, to this budget, and also to I I want to I I didn't didn't do this yesterday, but I want to thank my staff, mm -hmm. my office staff. They're such an amazing group of people who help me do my job, <laughs> and also work very closely with the with council members and city administration. We would not I would not be able to do my job without. Uh, Without without their their support, so big big thank you to them. Also to administration, administration, city clerk office, uh, budget office, for walking us through this process. Very difficult process, and supporting uh, our work and uh, finding the ways to maintain an enhanced 
critical core services while keeping taxes affordable. Over the past few weeks, uh, we have gone through this budget carefully to find savings for city taxpayers. While 6.6% is higher than what was originally planned, more than what I prefer, and I have some subsequent motions to deal with that. Edmontonians are grappling with the same cost pressures that city of Edmonton is. Inflationary pressures have led to higher than anticipated costs in some areas, while the revenue is down in others. But this budget responds to the concerns we have heard from Edmontonians and provides more funding for core services, while also allocating more for key priorities. Investing in public transit is climate action. It improves equity and access to better jobs and employee attraction for businesses. Public transit also helps with affordability for low-income and middle-income Edmontonians who are currently paying too much for transportation. This budget also responds, responsibly funds salary increases for police and funds the police funding formula. It supports initiatives like the anti-racism work, reconciliation work, and continuous funding to create safer public spaces. Making budget decisions is challenging at the best of times, let alone in the middle of an affordability crisis. But we must maintain core city services, make investments that will help support our city as it continues to grow, and make it one of the best places in Canada to live, run a business, and raise a family. To sum up, the additional increases will pay for more bus service to improve affordability. Invest in public safety and wellness so public spaces are safer for everyone. And more affordable housing so that more Edmontonians have a safe place to call home. Invest in anti-racism and reconciliation to build an Edmonton for all of us. We are doing this while reducing the proposed tax levy impact by $8 million. This has not been an easy process. This, I would, as I said earlier, this is the most difficult city budget that I have, uh, I have dealt with. But I think we got to the right place with more work to be done ahead of us and look forward to further conversations with our administration. And I have full confidence. I have full confidence in our city manager, in our city administration to bring forward ideas that we will consider uh, in, in April to either further bring down the tax levy or reallocate those resources into priorities that Edmontonians want us to, uh, to do so. With that, deepest appreciation to everyone and thank you to Edmontonians for uh, giving us this great opportunity to lead our, lead our city at the most difficult time uh, in, uh, in our recent history. So with that, I will take the chair back. Returned. And I will uh, uh, call the vote. And on the capital. We will vote on the capital first. We are just missing one vote. Uh, it did not show up on my screen. I'm no. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 11 to 2. Now we will vote on the operating adjustments. Please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 12 to 1. So that concludes this process.
And we will take a break now. Mayor Sorry. Sohi, as yeah. we have four minutes left, would you mind terribly if we vote to keep some of those attachments in private? I can put... Sure, Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, we'll put the wording on the screen for you there. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I'll move that attachment five, item 5.1 of the November 7 financial corporate services report remain private pursuant to section 27. Um, two, attachment 10 of item 5.1 of November 7th, financial corporate services report remain private pursuant to section 25. Three, that attachment five, item 5.2 of the November 7, 2023 financial corporate services report remain private pursuant to sections 21, uh, disclosure harmful to intergovernmental relations and 24 advice from officials and 25, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of a public body. And for that private discussion and private portions of the presentations of November 7th, uh, financial corporate services report remain private pursuant to sections 21, uh, disclosure harmful to intergovernmental relations, 24, advice from officials, and 25, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of a public body, uh, uh, something, something. Of the Freedom Something. of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. What she said. Thank you. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. So please vote. Wait, I have a question. Sorry, you have a question, Councillor Rutherford? What is it? Go ahead, please. Just, sorry, which one of these did, because there was some from that presentation that could be made. Yeah, that's right. So the way that it's worded is that you're only keeping the private portions in private and the okay. public actually we released the public yesterday. Okay, perfect. Just Thank wanted to so double much. check that. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote now. <laughs> Somebody wants to speak to it? <laughs> Please vote. We have 13 votes. Please display the votes. That is carried. We have two minutes remaining. Anything else you want us to do, Erin? <laughs> no, thank you. Right on. Okay. We'll be back at 1.30. Until then, we are on the recess.
this meeting back to order. And I will start with a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prinsby. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Before we go into our subsequent motions, I want to welcome some students who are joining us today. Uh, they are from their school, Donald R. Gary, grade six class. And that is Ward Ipi Kokani Piaste. That is Councillor uh, Rice is your uh, ward councillor. She's joining us virtually for the meeting. And uh, they are here with their councillor, a uh, sorry, the councillor, their teacher, their teacher, Sherry Vanderhoek. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I just had a chance to talk to uh, them uh, while coming into the meeting earlier on. Uh, very brief chat. I understand they're going to be talking about uh, a very important uh, uh, topic that is on uh, many Edmontonians' mind during summer when they're walking on the sidewalk, particularly in busy uh, business areas. And uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Elia, you want to come down to the, uh, to the, uh, to the mic and explain us uh, what are you going to be doing? Okay, tell us, what are you going to be debating today? So today we're going to um, see if, like, can uh, e-scooters be allowed on sideways? Oh, if e e-scooters should be allowed on sidewalks? Yes. Mm -hmm. That'll be a very topic, a good, good topic for discussion. And uh, so hopefully when you make your decision, would you let us know what you decide? Yes. Okay, just do let us know, because we do get calls from constituents about uh, whether e-bikes should be allowed on sidewalks, or sometimes they actually, people leave them on the sidewalk, in the middle of the sidewalk, which uh, is not a good thing to do, it's not a safe thing to do for them, but uh, good. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and look, uh, uh, good luck with your deliberation, okay? Thank you. All right, take care. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we are on to subsequent motions. Who wants to start first? Yeah, no worries. Uh, Councillor, please log in. I'm trying to, but here we go. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so. Both of my subsequents relate to heritage items. I don't know if you'd want me to make them as a point one and two, or if you just want me to do point one, point one and two. And then if people want to move to divide, they can do that. That's fine too. Yeah. Okay, so if that's okay with the clerk, sorry I didn't run that by you ahead of time, but you, you have both worded there. So I will move. Um, uh, oh wait, and I should actually go down to the subsequent section here instead of the other one. So that administration provide a report assessing options and the impact of funding the historic resource management strategy as proposed on page 148 of attachment two of no, the, the November 7th, 2023 financial and corporate services reports. And point two, that administration provide a report assessing options and the impact of funding the direct control zoning for the Glenora Heritage Character Area Service Package as proposed on page 147 of attachment two of the November 7th Financial and Corporate Services Report. Okay, we need a seconder. Second. Second. Councillor Hamilton. 
Okay. Uh, all right, can you make the introduction, please, Councillor Nack? Uh, sure, uh, quickly. Uh, so the point one would be specifically in reference to the strategy that we've been talking about that was identified in the audit and that to date we haven't funded. Uh, I think one question that came up and why I think it's good to have a report on this specifically is getting a sense of what is the work plan for what is currently a fairly small team within the, uh, the uh, urban planning and economy branch. I think there's only about two people that are regularly doing this work. So uh, while it's important, the question is, what is their work plan look like? Maybe we don't need new funding for this. Maybe we just need to reprioritize the work, but let's get a report to figure out what they're working on what the timeline is for that work. And if we really want to prioritize it, then when this report comes back, we could have a budget conversation. Um, I'll, I'll briefly talk about point two, because uh, that time wouldn't be accurate. Uh, I think just to say the Glenora piece is one that uh, we've talked about as a council. I think there needs to be, the, there's, there's a number of communities and I'd actually like to broaden it. I just, I appreciate the wording is specific to that one service package, but I'd actually like to have a broader conversation about any communities that have a, a larger number of heritage homes and figuring out uh, how we best support that. If you read through the service package, this was supposed to happen a year after the other work. So this wouldn't, this you would finish the strategy work first and then you would move into community specific work. The report that will come back will detail all of that. So we'll have that information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Now, questions on the subsequent. Bye, everyone. Nice, thank, nice meeting you. Yeah. Have a good trip, okay? All right, questions, colleagues? Councillor Tang, you have questions or you have subsequent? Okay. And Councillor Stevenson, questions or subsequent? Um. <laughs> to the mover. Uh, thank you for putting this forward. Um, could you talk me through what options might look like? Like, are the options not funded or don't fund it? The options are fund it or reprioritize the work plan of the heritage planners within the city. And, and I don't know what else they have on their work plan. And so I wouldn't want to presuppose that yet. So Ms. Petron is, uh, had started to do some work. She might have some answers since we talked about it yesterday if you want to ask her, but I think we needed that time to get a sense of what they're doing. And Okay, I mean, certainly I see that for the first one, maybe just for the second point. What, uh, what are the other <clears throat> options? I think the main option on that front uh, would be if we were going to do that, because knowing there was a, there had been a previous motion that was not, that council did not approve, um, in part because I think there were a lot of concerns around would that essentially prevent change from happening in alignment with the, the city plan and the district planning work. I had originally had another motion that I was thinking of making during the zoning bylaw renewal for the Glenora piece to, um, uh, to directly align with the district plans, but make sure we're, how do we build in the heritage consideration? Because even reading the draft district plans, I'm not clear how, if anything, if we're gonna do anything more in any community related to more preservation of heritage homes. So mm -hmm. uh, so I think that I, I would like to see a little more information about can can those two actually coexist? We, we say they can, <laughs> but I don't know if our strategies yeah. align. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think I think that that's, that's reasonable. That has that question or that discussion has relevance in Westmount uh, certainly as well. That's not what I'm reading in the second point. So I couldn't, because the service package only included that one community, I would be happy for a friendly amendment to broadly talk about heritage preservation in communities across the city or with just an understanding from administration that they will, they will not look exclusively to one community. I would hate for it to be about one only, but I, I sure. wanted to reference the service package. Sure, well, and I, if, again, just going back to, to one, uh, I would maybe miss to Ms. Petrin, um, would point number one in, uh, involve, like, so we'd be looking at the, the work plan. Would that not sort of look at, again, that more holistic, all, all communities, what priority needs there are? 
Correct, yeah, so I would suggest the strategy work would look holistically at the city and then would inform an implementation plan which could be neighborhood specific or not. Okay. And just to add, in terms of the work that the team is doing, they're focused solely on designations at this time. That's the capacity of the team, right, heritage right. designations. Right, and so a lot of the funding is, um, you know, potentially having a, a consultant who does the, the additional work on, on some of the strategic pieces. So, so again, maybe back to the mover. So I'm, I'm just, I'm still unclear what we're getting to in point two that we're not addressing in point one, recognizing that they're gonna look holistically at all the neighborhoods and all the heritage work. So I, I the reason I would still leave it uh, for myself, why I would be comfortable still leaving that in is I am not clear what happened. Let's, <laughs> we haven't even done the strategy, so it's hard for me to presuppose what happens after that. But at a high level, we have understood that the strategy would then result in some type of work happening in communities across the city. Mm -hmm. What that looks like, the funding requirements, how it's gonna be done is uncertain. A lot of that would come out of the strategy, but we should, I'd also like to have that information to get a sense of scope and scale. Are we thinking it's gonna be three communities in the city? Is it gonna be 20 or mm -hmm. is it gonna be 50? I, I don't know yet and so I, I'd love to leave that more broad to say like yes, Glenora and, <laughs> um, but I just, the, the service package doesn't reference it so I can't, I couldn't incorporate the other communities in that wording of that motion. Yeah, and I think for me the, if, if we were to broaden that to say, you know, to, for direct control zoning throughout key throughout priority neighborhoods in the city. Like again, I feel like that's that still would be information contained in point number one. So uh, anyway, I'm speaking to in some ways, but um, just wondering again, um, I think when we had the last conversation, are you aware of any other, of any private properties that have sought designation in Glenora since our last conversation, recognizing that that's a readily available tool? Some kicking tires, but again, it's. I think there's a, I think part of what they're asking for is a broader strategy as well, because I don't know if that's been the right solution to, to get us where we wanted. Fair enough, thank you, thanks so much. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford to move, move amendments, right? Yeah. Or questions, go ahead, please. Yeah, just quickly, um, to Ms. Petrin, isn't there, like I remember the that there was a map that showed in each of the wards some of the neighborhoods broadly speaking, that were historically significant. Am I like imagining this map that I'm seeing in my head and where it came from? Like don't we already have that scope? Uh, I'm just gonna maybe, I'm not sure about the, the map you might be referencing, so I'm gonna I ask Kent. I feel like Kent. it came from the Historical Society, maybe. Perhaps, Kent, is there any context you can share on that question? I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, <clears throat> a specific map, but there is a map that is is very accurate and fresh in terms, it's contained in the district plan drafts. It shows all of those um, heritage um, structures. But the heritage structures, but like, so I remember at one point, and again, like, please forgive me because we get so much stuff thrown at us. So this is like a vague memory I'm trying to parse out here. I remember the Ward and Olnick, I remember seeing Ward and Olnick and the two neighborhoods in Ward and Olnick that were identified as historically significant were Inglewood and Calder. And I think that there was a map for every ward that showed neighborhoods, but the reason I'm bringing, yeah, so I just, if, we, if not, I'm guessing, I'm, my point is, is that we, like, are we building on new work or do we already have that work is what I'm trying to understand. I think, Councillor, if I may, um, we do have a pretty good understanding of areas and structures that are significant, but significant to a certain value set and perspective. And mm -hmm. the strategy is looking, intended to be more inclusive. Um, and not just a narrow segment of what is historical or heritage worthy um, for protection. So it's it's a much more broad, comprehensive, not just where, but what are we looking to preserve as well? Yeah, okay, and I think, I, I, I sh I'm, at first I was like all for supporting the subsequent, but now I'm like really grappling with it because when is the plan, the work plan from urban planning coming forward. Councillor Rutherford, that's related to the zoning bylaw team's work plan and prioritization. So it's just the, the zoning bylaw? Correct. And so in the zoning bylaw work plan, 
why wouldn't we, if this is from an audit report and it's an outstanding auditor re recommendation and we've had a bunch of discussion within the context of the zoning bylaw, why wouldn't some of those resources be allocated to number one? So the zoning bylaw team's work is focused on bylaw amendments and number one is related to a heritage strategy. Yeah. So policy, more policy work, which falls. But the resource, like, so like I'm just thinking about, I'm just trying to understand because again, I'm just challenging here in terms of like there is a lot of resources allocated to the zoning bylaw and I know there's resources to implementation. But could not some of, don't some of those resources have transferable skills that ought to be able to do some planning strategy? Yeah, I'm going to ask Kent to comment on how we are addressing the audit if the package, service package, isn't funded to do the strategy work. Yeah, so the, the audit will get the, the recommendations um, in the heritage audit from several years ago. They will get satisfied and they will get satisfied um, on the, the target deadline. But they'll be, the sad, without the funding to do the broad strategy, there will be more surgical minor updates to meet the minimum bar for what was in those audit, audit recommendations. So mm. the audit recommendations will be satisfied. That, that work can be done and is planned to do with current I mean, resources. At, at the end of the day, the audit committee will determine whether the audit, the, those, those are satisfied, just splitting hairs, yes. but... That's, yes. That's still in the purview yes. of us to decide if that's been satisfied. Correct? Correct. No, but yeah. when we worked with the audit uh, group saying on our plan and, and it seems reasonable. So we're tracking to something that yeah. we believe is reasonable. Okay. I guess to the mover, could there's a few things that are coming up that I think intersect with this where this conversation might be more appropriate, like the district planning conversation. I know you're not on committee for that one and I'm also thinking about the the work plan and, and a few other components as well as some audit committee discussions do why now so I, I would defer a little bit to Miss Petron but I, I asked the question about district planning in particular to Miss Petron uh, offline and uh, I'll, I'll try my best to summarize which is that I feel the district planning is more uh, again a implementation of the city plan and while the city plan references heritage there isn't as a lot of dedicated heritage work in those draft district plans and s I would s say similar to the zoning bylaw pieces since it's focused on amendments uh, to specific changes versus the broader strategy I I just don't see how it works in either of those two if a report comes back and there's a report that is aligned that we can tie it into I'd be happy to but right now I think I needed something sorry thank you Councillor. All right, so that concludes the questions on these. Anyone to speak? You can split for voting, absolutely, one and two. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I consider an act to close. Yeah, uh, just real quick, I, I, I think just in defense of, of point two, and I appreciate why it's been requested to be split, um, is there are a number of communities that I think we need to do work like this on. Glenora is the one that is furthest along. We'd actually spent $400,000, if I remember to date, of the $500,000 that had been set aside for that work. And so it's the, the community that's furthest along in any work. Um, and, and so that's part of why I, I think there's still a, a very passionate desire from residents in that community to see that work done. I have been engaging them over and over for the last year and a bit to help them understand that I think there has been um, maybe some different perspectives and that the view of the work done to date um, was maybe being seen as a way to prevent implementation of the city plan or the district plans. And I think there's a way to move forward that, that actually does both. I'm not an expert in it. We need the advice of our heritage planners, but I don't think we've actually done our due diligence on that work. And so I'd like to keep that there, noting how much work has been done to date and how we could ideally then capitalize on that work combined with the updated work of what I think to be a future strategy. Uh, and then that could potentially serve as a model for other communities. So I, I'd love to have that report still just to 
not single out a community. Appreciate that I've singled out this community <laughs> with where they're at because of the status that we're at, but ideally serving as a model to help serve how we're going to address that going forward across the city if, if we feel there is even a way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Please board on, vote on part one. Just missing one vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And now we vote in part two. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Okay, now Councillor Rutherford. Sorry, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have uh, one subsequent that, that Councillor Cartmel and I have been swapping. So he may wish to be the seconder on this. Um, but I will move that administration as part of the upcoming report on downtown community revitalization levy prioritization, include the consideration, implications of, and alternatives to providing one-time grant to the Windspear Center project phase three in the amount of $12.8 million to help address project cost escalation. Second. Um, briefly to, to introduce this. So the Windspear has been uh, you know, an outstanding part of our downtown for many years now. Uh, in a world, <laughs> I was just told, someone told me never to use world class, but truly uh, the Windspear Center is world class. Um, it has not only done phenomenal programming within its own walls, um, it has provided wonderful public programming, I think as many of us witnessed in the Symphony on the Square this summer and in, in the past. Um, they also support education, uh, outreach and education for, for youth through their Yona Sistema program, which has profound impacts across our whole city. Um, the Windspear uh, was undertaking the expansion of their building, and when an opportunity arose to partner with the City of Edmonton um, to develop our downtown district energy system, they slowed down their project. They, they took time, they stopped, they came to the table with us as partners, um, and came up with a you know truly phenomenal integrated plan, but which did so, so that had a huge advantage and benefit for us as a city in terms of delivering our downtown district energy system. Um, but it came with a delay in their project, and that delay um, has led to them being caught up in in the significant cost escalation that we as a city have experienced and many others have experienced. Um, I appreciate, as we all very clearly know, how constrained our budget is. Um, so this motion is really just intended to look at whether the downtown community revitalization levy could be a potential funding source and just exploring what other alternatives there might be to support their ongoing work um, in our community. So look forward to taking any questions. Thank you very much. And sorry, this information, this, this is just for information at this point, to be clear. Um, it would just be coming forward with some options and considerations that in no way binds us to, to providing that contribution. They're seeking contribution from other orders of government as well. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. <laughs> Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? I just have a couple yeah, of questions. Yeah, I have the chair. So we also, I think, gave direction to administration to prioritize the conversion, uh, right? So this will come along with that or will come separate from that? Yes, it will be part of that report. So yeah. um, so my understanding of the direction was not to prioritize office conversions, but to say we have a number of outstanding capital projects. We have this idea of conversions. Now we're going to have this idea of investing in the Windspear Center. How do those shake out when we okay. look at them against each other? Got it. Okay, okay. But at like you're not 
I'm a big fan of Winspear, mm -hmm. and I worked really hard to secure their federal funding when it was uh, uh, in, in the federal government. It is a phenomenal project. I understand the cost of it. I just want to make sure we're not talking about funding this through tax levy. We're talking about within the CRL. That is precisely why, um, uh, you know, Councillor Carmel and I in conversation felt that this was the most appropriate forum for that discussion to see if that is a feasible. So this is linked to the former Galleria project, yeah. which was a priority in the CRL. Yeah. So yeah, that's the intent is, is to look at this option, which is not uh, directly tax levy. Got it. Related. Okay, good. Look, good. Thank you. I'll take the chair back. Returned. And I see no more questions. Uh, anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Stevenson to close. Nothing further to add. Thank to you. To vote, please vote. Please vote. We have 13 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. On well, next was Councillor Rutherford. Go ahead, please. Okay. Rutherford, I... you. Go ahead. Yeah. And then we're just going around until we finish all the subsequent. Oh, bring them all along. But not all at once. Well, you do it all at once. Okay, well, I'll do the first one then. Uh, that administration provide a report and analysis on the, it's uh, SM02, on the recommended route and service adjustments for the additional transit service hours delivery, including a transit equity lens. Second. Second. Karen got first. Okay. Councillor Prince Bay seconded. Please make the introduction. Yeah, so I, again, so, so glad that we are prioritizing transit. And I just want to make sure, you know, I've seen a lot of trends within the transit that we, we, we place a lot of emphasis on growth uh, and where there's growth and demand. And I think we've had a few reports and, and especially being on CUDA and going to a few of the CUDA conferences, there's been a lot of discussion on transit equity and how that intersects with transit planning. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, as we're doing these new route allocations within the service hours we've just approved that we're not necessarily saying don't think about growth don't think about demand but how are we also thinking about transit equity so that's the intent of this motion thank you councillor rutherford uh who's next online there's councillor so, councillor paquette right because i have a question Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair? Yeah, I have the chair. Yeah. So I just want to understand the. I think this is. I think this will be very interesting information because one thing that uh, uh, I think was one neighborhood on the north side that we were looking at, where there's a obviously a low income neighborhood, right, and but have very little access to public transit. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you're looking at, right? How do we how do we look at the overall resiliency or what is available in the neighborhood and how do we how do we make sure that those most vulnerable or near vulnerability neighborhoods are having access to good services including transit? Yes, uh, exactly. And I think we've had a few reports and one that I will point to is the report that came forward that looked at a map, it was really, it was really powerful. It was a map that overlaid three identity factors, seniors, uh, low income and indigenous, and sort of, and then overlaid that with roots and mm -hmm. showed that there is definitely some clear examples of where there was also all three of those demographics in certain neighborhoods that were also underserved by transit. Mm -hmm. and, and we accepted that report for information. And I feel like it's a duty to say, now that we've got these service hours, should we not consider that for example, within the context of this mm. transit planning. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And one of the reasons that may not be meeting, you know, may not be getting access to transit is because the, they are below service standards for whatever historical reasons as well. Exactly, and well, that's, that's the other thing that I've definitely <laughs> noted is that sometimes demand perpetuates more demand, but if we don't build a good transit system, and a robust transit system, we're not, we're gonna see demand increase in certain areas and not decrease in others. Got it, okay, good. That's, 
glad I asked because that's what I'm kind of thinking that way too. Okay, good. I'll take the chair back and go to Councillor Wright. I think that was basically the clarification I was looking at as well, but I know we've also gotten reports back um, about putting in transit like right at the start of a development in that. Um, would that be something that might be considered as well? I, I absolutely. Or I think that the transit equity is is very open and I, I know Carrie uh, with with transit and and Eddie who just received award at CUTA by the way so I just Ooh. gonna put that out there um, you know definitely know more about and have had more robust conversations about transit equity I gave an example of three things that overlay but absolutely there's many things and that's what that report would bring back and I think allow us the opportunity to say with this opportunity of new transit hours even on demand how do we maybe we need to have a regular transit route somewhere where it's being served by on demand now where how are we prioritizing where the new on demand goes as an example okay excellent thank you looking forward to this information thank you Councillor Wright okay so that concludes the questions uh, now anyone to speak no, Councillor Rutherford to close? Nothing further, thank you. Please for vote. We have 12 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Do we have the information about the school? Hi, kids. How's everyone doing? Nice to see you all. Are you are just one class? Ooh. All right, so I want to welcome students joining us from Donald R. Getty School Grade 6 class. They are here with their teacher, uh, Chelsea Benson. And uh, your ward is Ward E.P. Kokinepiosti. Uh, your ward counselor is Counselor Rice. And she's joining us virtually for this meeting. Thank you so much for joining us. We saw your uh, other class come in earlier on. Are you, uh, are you talking about the same subject that the other class was talking about? Whether we should have uh, e-scooters e e -scooters on sidewalks? Have you decided? Did you already have that debate? Or you, uh, you did? OK, good, right on. We want to know the results. <laughs> Who is the mayor? Who is the mayor? Mayor, what's your name, mayor? Liam. 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 Liam, come down here. Come on. Come on, come to the podium. This is becoming, well, we'll I think we'll do that for every school. <laughs> it's part of the fun, you know? Our job is pretty boring, right? So you guys, when you guys come in, it, uh, it becomes more entertaining and uh, um, more enjoyable. Yes, what did you decide? Uh, we decided um, that e-scooters should be allowed on sidewalks. They should be. Okay, what was the vote? How many voted in uh, favor? We got, basically, everyone voted. There was like zero against. Yeah, unanimous vote on having e-scooters. Can you give me, give me one reason why? Um, because um, on the road, it could... Uh, if e-scooters were on the road, it could um, cause traffic problems or the electric scooter could die in the middle of the street, like lose all of its power mm. from low battery. 
That's a pretty good, I think that's a pretty good point. You can all, all of a sudden, the scooter will stop and there's a car behind you, right? Then uh, pretty dangerous, yeah? Yeah. Cool, that's, that's a pretty, but that's pretty, pretty logical reason to uh, allow them on, uh, on sidewalks. Well, thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Woohoo! <laughs> we have another class with us. And that is grade six class from school St. Augustine. And they are here with their teacher, Je Jerica. Jerica Pierce. Jerica Pierce. And uh, your ward is Ward Pepistol. Counselor Jens is your uh, ward counselor. They are also joined by Edmonton Catholic School Board trustee. Lisa Trichensky. There you are, sitting at the back. All right. There's a lot of sun from the back, so we can't really, yeah, we can't really see you. Thank you so much for joining us. You're part of a city, city Hall School, right? Uh, this is day one. Day one of City Hall. Right on. Are you going to do your mock console too? What are you going to be discussing? Same thing. And you haven't decided yet, yet, right? And are they going to come back after they made the, make the decision? Are they going to probably come back to see us? Yeah, let Councillor Jans know what you are uh, <laughs> going to decide on that, uh, uh, that topic, okay? <laughs> right, yeah. Cool. Well, nice to see you all. Uh, stick around as long as you want. Probably see you in the uh, uh, see, see you around at City Hall because you're going to be here for uh, for a few days, right? So, so what we have done, we concluded our discussion on the budget. Budget means the money that we need to run our city for next year and years into the future. And so we concluded that discussion. Now we are uh, the number of questions were raised during the budget. Now we are raising those questions into, uh, turning those questions into motions, which means that uh, administration will work on those and bring back a report to us so we can further explore those questions. That's what we are doing now. And Councillor Rutherford, you wanna uh, put forward another uh, subsequent? Sure. Um, that, and this one's pretty straightforward, so I'll just get this one out of the way, hopefully that administration provide a memo outlining the next park growth priorities and updated recommendations based on new information, including the social vulnerability index and GBA plus analysis. Need a seconder? Second. Councillor Nack. Okay, can you make the introduction, please? Yeah, so this one ended up, there was an unfunded capital pro profile in growth that wasn't funded in this very challenging budget that we had. However, um, I don't think that this is gonna be something that we don't wanna continue to have a conversation on. Uh, as we've talked about, there's many things that we're going to wanna be discussing and prioritizing. However, from the time that that uh, unfunded capital profile was uh, created and some information ha came forward around um, sort of where we're seeing growth in or growth, population growth not matching parks and some of the social issues we're seeing and pressures on certain parks around the area. I just thought it was important to say, do a validation check with integrated infrastructure services. Do these same priorities still align for administration or does this new information change those priorities and if so, how? So again, just a memo, nothing, nothing to be done with it at this time, just getting that information. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang, questions? Yeah, um, I think you may have, you may or may not have touched on it, but just wanna confirm, how does this stack up uh, in terms of our new community parks framework policy? Or maybe, yeah, go ahead. Do you wanna ask that to him or me? Well, if you have an answer, if not, I can go to administration. Or is this in the context of that, that policy work? It's specifically, I would say that they're separate. Okay. Um, but I, I would be 
remiss to ask how we're funding the framework as well, because we have no funding for growth full stop. Right. Um, but this was a specific cap capital profile and it was prioritizing school parcels, um, which maybe in the context of the park framework might actually change priorities as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe to, over to administration. Um, perhaps Ms. Petron, if you can comment on this in the context of the community parks framework. It is connected and I'll just pass to Kent uh, Snyder to just add some additional context. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, they are connected, <clears throat> so we would, uh, but but they are as well separate. So um, we would, uh, in answering this motion, consider the uh, community parks framework, um, but look at what we currently have for priority and, and the upcoming budget requests and layer in the social vulnerability index and GBA plus analysis just to ensure that those immediate funding priorities match um, those particular criteria and filters, and then as well, the community um, planning framework, parks framework, sorry. Yeah, I guess too earlier to Councillor Rutherford's point, um, the, community, the community parks framework is also, um, does not have much resourcing behind that. Um, we're talking about a couple of work that are unfunded but you have the resource to move that forward, I guess. So the, the, this doesn't change the funding envelope, but this is very much in alignment with the breathe assessment that is going on at the district level as well. So there is um, capacity to do this work to answer this question, but it won't bring forward funding suggestions, but if funding were available, it would help um, put on the table the priorities. So I, in my mind, I'm thinking about some of the, the well, maybe I'm thinking more like playgrounds on, like school playgrounds on city property that we've had a lot of conversation about in the last couple of years. Um, so this subsequent motion or the, the, the memo would not have any information really to those pieces, correct? Potentially. So okay. the report that, that is attached to the unfunded service package talked about the amenities, so those playgrounds. And this, I believe the intent is more of broader park development to a base level. Okay, okay that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. So that concludes the questions on this subsequent. Uh, Councillor, anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Rutherford to close or to vote? Yeah, just simply again, uh, this is this is simply for information, but it's important information as we do grapple with some of our priorities, I think, on a go forward basis. So that's the intent here. Thank you. Please vote. We have 12 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, last one, right? Yes. So my last one is uh, number three, that administration provide a report that incorporates feedback from the Accessibility Advisory Committee and Seniors Planning Council uh, to understand their lived experiences, wants and needs related to an assisted snow clearing program pilot project sorry, it's moving, <laughs> which includes eligibility program options and a potential service package budget and recommended pilot length and timeline. Second. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Uh, can you please make the introduction? Sure, so again, this is one of the ones similar to, I know some of the other subsequent that will come that while we um, didn't put it into this budget, I know that we have to have further conversation a, a, about it, but one of the reasons that it didn't uh, make it into this budget, I think is actually a, an unintended gift in terms of the gift of time to make sure that we get whatever assisted snow clearing program in place, that it actually serves the mm -hmm. people we are trying to have it serve. And so I think better involvement with both of the, the Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Seniors Planning Council are, are important elements in, in making sure that whatever is proposed as a program has really put those, those voices uh, at the, the forefront of that. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Councilor Wright, questions? Um, I'm just also wondering, um, I, I noticed that the, uh, the Seniors Home Supports Program with the province is under transition right now. Could that report also include, um, I guess, consultation with the province as to what they're planning on doing with that program? And, and are they maybe expanding it to include those with accessibility issues or mobility issues? We would be happy to collaborate with uh, whoever makes mo the most sense to bring back a comprehensive package. Okay, so that will include the province then. We don't need to specify that or? If the mover is comfortable, uh, we understand the direction. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, first, just a, maybe a, a minor friendly amendment to Seniors Coordinating Council okay. rather than Seniors yep. Planning Council, so we know yep. um, the seniors right organization. Yep. Um, and then, I guess to the mover, you th are you thinking this, like, I guess, what's the timeline you're thinking of getting this report back? Do you think, would you foresee this pilot project benefiting this winter we're talking about potentially? So I have the due date in the which is I'm seen is not on the display uh, for Q2 2024. So it would not affect this winter season. It would be um, making sure that we have the conversation in 2024 to set, and I mean, I'm biased to ideally set this up for, for the next winter season, but I think the time has passed to realistically set anything meaningfully up for this winter season. So since we aren't going to be able to set anything up meaningfully this season, how do we make sure that what we do set up really hits the mark well? Even as a pilot project, we can we still know through some of the initial emails and correspondence that's come in from these two particular parties that there is some more conversations that need to be had to to do this work. Yeah, I'm 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 curious about an approach of doing by. Lear, uh, learning by doing rather than learning by conversing more. And I guess I'm just curious to Mr. Robar, um, you know, given that this is the first time in many, many years that we haven't had a snowfall in November, um, each day that it doesn't snow, is there a potential, I guess, savings there that could potentially fund um, a pilot version of something to kind of develop a bit of a process of, of some of the some of the steps here that could better inform the next season. So on, on the budget side of it, we keep all the staff on hand. So as far as significant budget savings, those staff right now are redeployed doing other pieces of work in the city. Uh, so there's not a significant savings that's happening as part of the budget itself. Okay, that's too bad. Cause I think that would be very informative as, as well. Um, so you're looking, uh, so then ideal, um, ideally administration will be working, would you say pretty hand in hand with the Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Seniors Coordinating Council, maybe drawing upon some of the experiences say from Calgary um, that has a similar kind of program? Yes, and um, since we came to committee uh, back in, I don't know when, when it was, May or June, we have had significant conversations with both of those entities, and they have really helped to uh, inform our, our paths next, like our paths forward. We've been in conversations with Calgary, and we've improved our web uh, presence as well. We recognize that uh, City of Edmonton seniors aren't necessarily getting their fair share of access to the low income. Uh, program with the GOA, and so uh, amplifying that opportunity. So we've already taken some steps um, in our web presence um, already, uh, which I think is pointing us in the, in the right direction. Sorry, can you just explain to me what you mean by web presence or expanding that, just having the information on our websites, you mean? That's correct. So now we directly link to the Seniors Home Supports Program. We also have a link to the Government of Alberta's Special Needs Assistance for Seniors. Um, I think that there's a that was a missed opportunity in years past, mm -hmm. and I think Calgary has shown us that when, since 2021, they have put a, a bit of a spotlight on that GOA program. Uh, I believe that Calgary actually gets 50% of that GOA uh, dollars, and we certainly can step up our game by ensuring that our seniors in Edmonton are aware. And, and I guess that kind of gets at the earlier question from Councillor Wright about um, 
that particular provincial program in transition. And then I guess I'm wondering if you can just explain to me a bit more on the um, supporting people with disability aspect. So the senior part, I, I you know, I, I can see the clear line. Can you just like expand? I guess that's what this report will be, but if you can see a gist of what to look for. For sure, we're, we were gonna leverage some of the information that uh, city operations already has in terms of uh, their assisted waste bin program, right. and and so we we already know who those people are, uh, and, and there's a way to leverage that information to make this offer uh, to ensure that they are getting the support they need. So in the service packages or the information that was provided to committee a number of months ago, one of those enhanced options was to add not just dollars for the coordinating FTEs that would work with the GOA to leverage their program, but to also have some grant dollars uh, to help with the those with low mobility. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dan, Councilor Stevenson. Thank you very much, really appreciate this coming forward and I, I agree with the mover that having a bit more time to, to get this really robust, there's a lot of value there. Um, you know, learning a bit more about the program in, in Calgary, my, my mind goes to whether, so in these conversations, I mean, particularly with the Seniors Coordinating Council, can there be consideration of them taking on that work that, that those FTEs and those positions would actually work within their organization? I might pass this over to Keith, but it's my understanding that that offer was made and that they have some concerns about their own capacity. But Keith, if you're online, can you respond? Yeah, Councillor Stevenson, um, we have had those conversations. Um, the Edmonton uh, Senior Coordinating Council has also communicated with the province to ask about uh, support from there and working in, in collaboration with some of the information or the, the programming being downloaded. Um, we, we're going to continue to have those conversations. Uh, I would expect that we would make sure that there is not a duplication of work and that the resources are used to advance whatever program that we're going to develop in the best way forward. Okay, great. I mean, so, so it sounds like all of those options are on the table. Again, they may not be possible, but that will be part right. of the, the discussion. Okay, great. Right. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Stevenson. Can you move the second one, please? Oh, we're still under suspended rules? No. no, we're not. No, that only applied for the budget. Well, yeah, the budget is right. Yeah, regular I, rules resume. Regular rules apply. I will move a second round. Okay, second. need a seconder? Second by Councilor Wright. Please vote for the second round. Bye. Nice to see you all. See you around. Okay? Don't forget to have fun. <laughs> Have fun on our behalf. Yes. <laughs> I think you're going to go on the LRT too, right? Cool. We are missing three votes. Okay, please vote. People haven't voted yet. <laughs> we have 13 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, Councillor Wright. Thank you. I'm just wondering, um, by... You know, thank you for expanding the website to have more information. I'm just wondering, is this also something that um, we could ask our 311 operators to be more aware of to, to refer people to the seniors program? Absolutely. I can check the 311 scripts to make sure they're updated. Okay, awesome. And then I'm just wondering, in that information from the province, could we also find out how many GOA staff that they have to administer our administration of their program? I can certainly ask. Okay, thank you. I'm just, I'm just concerned. You know, I think all organizations are concerned with red tape production, and, and I, I just think this is adding to it. Um, and then also, um, again, concern with you know what or you know knowledge of what the seniors program is, but but um, for those with mobility, um, like can we determine if it would be. Um, like, or I guess, how would we determine somebody with mobility issues? Would it be somebody recovering hospital? Do they have to be H recipient? I think for simplicity, we would leverage what is done for the assisted waste bin program and not duplicate efforts. Okay, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the, 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 the assisted waste. There's, is that a low income or is it just mobility? I'll have to get back to you on that. I can, okay, I can look it up then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wright. So that concludes the questions on this one. Anyone to speak? 
to speak briefly, Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you very much for the mover for bringing this forward. This was one of the those items that didn't quite make it into the omnibus that I was extremely sad uh, and paying to to see it out. And um, and I know there is kind of questions about who should be managing what and what is the best governance and structure to kind of carry out this work. But in, you know, I think in the last while we've had so many conversations about assisted snow and never really landed on something that kind of. Um, that really worked, and I'm I'm open to trying this route, especially given kind of some of the, the um, the successes seen in other city in in Alberta, and perhaps you know given some of the, um, some of the programs still in transition, maybe there's an opportunity for for program improvement as well. Um, I know this is something you know the the accessibility. I, at least for accessibility advisory committee, feel very passionate about uh, snow removal is con continuously to be a top priority for that committee. Um, and this is something I've heard very extensively uh, from um, seniors organizations, from the coordinating council and from residents. Um, so I, you know, I, I appreciate the approach here and I look forward to when this report comes back. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, thanks. I'll be brief, but I do want to highlight that even before this omnibus, it was actually a motion at council that was withdrawn. I I regret that now, uh, but at the time there was just so much uh, coming at us that I felt it was prudent. Um, but here we are. Sometimes you know this is this is a direct conversation I had about sometimes it's better to have some money that we can do something with than where we are today, which is no money. And so I hope we can get our ducks in a row so that when this does come back. We have a clear understanding of, of the program, and I think it is a bit confusing. And I, I've even recently, as recently as today, seen some correspondence of like maybe they should be two separate programs because it's creating too much confusion. Uh, even though I would say there's intersectionality a lot of time with people with disabilities and and uh, seniors, so uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think those are all things that we have to grapple with and and further further discuss. So I really. I don't want to see this not happen. I just want to see it happen in a way that brings people along and centers the voices of people with disabilities and seniors at the heart of whatever we're creating. So I hope you, I have your support for this and for the further conversation that this will generate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. Um, yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next, Councillor Tang, then Councillor Hamilton. Sorry, Councillor uh, Cartmill after that. Um, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is my subsequent motion 02. Um, I did have a a couple prepared, but I think for now I'm just going to put this one forward. Uh, that administration provide a report outlining staffing ratios and options for reducing the number of management and or supervisor positions in each of the community services, integrated infrastructure services, and office of the city manager departments due date before 2024 fall supplemental operating budget adjustment. Second. Second by Councillor Neck, please introduction, uh, in, uh, make, uh, make introduction, yes. sorry. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, I really appreciate some of the very useful information the administration has shared through uh, the memos in this budget about the supervisor, non-supervisor, and management versus non-management ratios. I think we can keep going. Um, I'm mindful that there was a recent motion by Councillor Neck during the pandemic, this was the last term, to review middle management that did generate some results. Um, I have taken lesson from that and I think with the OP12 um, exercise we have going on, which as several colleagues mentioned, we do have quite a bit of progress still to go to reach our targets. I think now is a time uh, to further dig into this. Um, and also about a year ago, we had a public presentation in council from the then employee services about the city's org structure. There were about seven strata of leadership between when a policy direction is set to when the service is delivered at the front line. And that's pretty quite, like that's pretty recent. And I wanna provide some intention in terms of where I like to see more attention in OP12, because I think so far I haven't quite seen it. 
um, it's this is not meant to be a broad stroke review um, like the pre like, like the pre previous motion did. Um, I do like to see some specific area um, dive deeper. Uh, I would prefer to go into private, subject to sub FOIP action, uh, FOIP Act Section 24, if um, uh, to provide more details as to which specific area I have in mind, and welcome feedback from my colleagues um, and administration. Um, and I finally, I want to be clear that this request is for a report and options, all of which will help to support decision making at the next fall SOBA. Uh, where I think, again, we'll be faced with difficult decisions. So I appreciate all the work our staff does. Um, and with where we are uh, with OP12 now, we need to explore all opportunities for realigning our departments to support frontline services and council priorities, which reflect the city plan, the needs of Edmontonians. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Nack, questions? Just more, uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm happy to move to go into private if folks want to get a little more information. So I'll, I'll m make that motion because I think there's a desire to maybe hear those specifics. So subject to the sections. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Just move, I'm just moving to go into private so we can get that explanation. Okay. Can are you move, need a seconder? Second. Second. Okay, please vote. Subject to whatever. 24. 24. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We'll give you a couple of minutes to lock the doors and make sure the right people. Yeah, can we just.
Are we ready? We are live online. Okay, great. Uh, Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Great, Mr. Mayor. I will withdraw uh, subsequent motion number six. Okay. All right. That is, uh, seems to be okay with everyone. Okay. All right. It's withdrawn. Uh, Councillor Cardinal. You have five minutes. You want to make the introduction? Oh, we can wait. Uh, or might be, you might be done in five minutes. I have several. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, you get to pick the easier, easy, easiest one first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I will start with, I have three that are sort of related. So I'll start with what was OP04 for me. And so I, this is sort of restated from what, what is going to be an operating motion. So what I have now is that administration bring forward an unfunded service package for consideration by council during the spring 2024 Supplemental operating budget adjustment to increase tax supported operations funding for Explore Edmonton by six million dollars in 2024, along with the results of an operational review of the Expo Center that considers the following: one, potential permanent integration of sports activities in halls A, B, and C, as generally described in the Expo Center for Sports Excellence business case; b, compatible compatibility of the exhibition lands planning framework with the ongoing operational needs of the Expo Center and C, consideration of ongoing needs for an outdoor festival space to accommodate K-Days and other festivals. Second. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, we talked a lot about EBCs earlier today, so I'm not gonna get too deep into that. We effectively deferred all but the one library piece in terms of funding to the spring. I, I think that's fine, but I do note that Explore has expressed uh, considerable consternation that they have roughly a $10 million, $10 million hole in their annual budget. So I think there's room for review of that. I think there's room for refinement of that. I think that there's uh, one, of their, one of their primary duties is uh, operation of the two venues, Expo Center and the Convention Center. And uh, there might be some opportunities there if there's an integration of uh, a more permanent, more deliberate integration of the sports activities into that space. Um, there might be financial considerations, there might be otherwise. Uh, and that might be a way that, um, uh, that the operating budget with respect to that venue is somewhat modified that then has an ongoing impact to the rest of the organization. So. Uh, this does not presume any funding. This does not presume any decision. It does put it on the table for the conversation in the spring. And uh, I think I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if that's a particularly articulate summary, but there's a couple of other motions that are mixed into this too that I have to offer. So. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartman. Councillor Wright, do you have questions on this? Yes, um, just very quickly. I, um, I think when you read it out, and I'm waiting to see it up on the hey. screen, you hey, had hey. mentioned six million. Okay, I wasn't hearing things. Um, why that number? I, I think this is great to get more details on, yeah, how, how things are being operated, but why six million? Well, I, I, I'll be honest, it's somewhat arbitrary, but I, you know, in listening to the conversation last week, there was questions about, you know, how much of, call it the, uh, the increased mandate for Explore Edmonton is really critical, how much of it is related to the operations of the venues, how much of it is, uh, related to event attraction, I'll say that because I have a, another subsequent related to that. So um, it's not all of what they ask for, it's roughly two thirds as a starting point. If we do this analysis and we under maybe understand better what is part of the venue operation generally, the number might change. Um, but it, it effectively is a marker for the spring. Okay, so it, yeah, so an unfunded package if it comes back at saying that they're, they're gonna need seven million we're, we're good to change that in there? Not, not that we're going to oh, approve it outright. But. Absolutely. I mean, it, I think that number becomes informed by the conversation okay. between now and then. Okay. All right. And you said you have got another one for the event attraction. I'll leave my quest other questions for that. Then. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Councillor Stevenson, you have a question on this, right? Okay, we'll take a break here then. We'll be back at 3.45. Okay. No worries.
Uh, we'll do a roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Councillor Prince Councillor Stevenson. Hello. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. I'm here. Councillor. <laughs> Maybe I think we'll just wait a couple of minutes. I think don't we have core? Don't have core. We are live on YouTube and Council on the Web. Okay, Councillor Wright. Roll call. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Okay, Councillor Prince Councillor Stevenson. Hello. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. I'm here. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cardmel. Hello. Councillor Rice. Hello. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good. Councillor Stevens and questions to Councillor Cardmel or, or to administration on the subsequent? Yeah, I mean, a bit of both. Um, maybe just to the mover to start. You know, I I think something that we hear from, from Explore Edmonton, which I think is really important for us to be aware of, is sort of what what mandate pieces were added to their plate kind of after the fact. And, and in my mind, part, at least part of the answer, maybe all of the answer, isn't, isn't necessarily increased funding but reduced mandate. So just wondering if, if that is a thread. I know you're looking specifically at Expo Center, but um, how that could potentially be woven in prior to, to making a funding decision? Yes, thank you. I, well, I think that in part, uh, council has indirectly communicated with Explore Edmonton by the lack of a tangible motion today. So, uh, you know, there needs to be at the very least clarity and understanding about what the mandate is and then perhaps what it should or shouldn't be. Uh, I would note that there is a shareholder meeting coming within the next two weeks and I expect that uh, the outcome of the budget process will be a topic of conversation. And perhaps that leads to a more pointed conversation about mandate, what's there, what isn't. Okay, and then just to administration, I don't know if this is handy, but I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, we had EEDC, we had these separate uh, organizations kind of come out of their like, do we have a sense of the order of magnitude of budget, like, for the one versus the three? Like, sorry, the one versus the, I'm struggling with the three. Uh, so um, I think it was Edmonton Global, uh, Edmonton Unlimited, and Explore Edmonton kind of came out of EEDC, if I'm remembering correctly. We, we have a funding agreement for each of those entities. So I'm going to go from memory here. Um, and we can correct if we have to after. Um, Explore Edmonton used to receive in the order of 20 to $22 million a year uh, for the mandate. At one point in time, we were instructed to strip out around 10 or $11 million and relook at the mandate for Explore. So Explore's mandate came down. So what, they're, what they have in the budget right now, the 11.7 million net operating requirement, is what we thought that the mandate would be, the cost of the mandate going forward. Since then though, um, like at the time that we determined that the go forward plan would be roughly 11 to $12 million in net operating requirement, uh, the Northlands properties have come in to play. Okay. Um, and the money that we had removed from Explore Edmonton, we had put into financial strategies 
And then we use that money to fund both Edmonton Global and Edmonton Unlimited. Okay. Okay, that's a helpful a helpful history. Um, okay, so I think I think in terms of some of the questions I've raised, this motion doesn't preclude exploration of those. This is just to ensure that something is coming back to us in the spring to have a conversation. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Stevenson. Council Salvador? Yep, thank you. Um, maybe just to start with the mover, uh, wondering if you, if you gave any thoughts uh, to this coming back as a report in advance of, of the spring as opposed to waiting until, uh, until the spring budget discussions themselves. I, I can just foresee B and C in particular generating um, a fair amount of dialogue and questions and potentially some interesting paths forward and, and options forward. Uh, so thoughts on, on that piece? Thank you. I think actually the conversation around B and C needs to happen as soon as possible because there's, I know there's other plans at work and Councillor Salvador, you'd know better than I, I would say. Um, I would note that I'm, this started as two motions, one being a funding amendment and the other being sort of a subsequent uh, hold in abeyance and subsequent work. So it's a, the language might be a bit funny. If pieces came back earlier, I don't think, I have no objection to that. Okay, yeah, and maybe to, to administration, um, what, like if B and C were to, or maybe I should ask, based on the way that this motion is worded right now, um, what would we be getting back in terms of an operational review? How do you see that unfolding? What type of information would um, would that generate? Can I pass it over to Roger? Yeah, so for the for part E, Explore Edmonton has completed a business case with three sport partners on sort of the viability of Paul's ABC being sport facilities. Um, I think the other ones we would need to work with real estate and, and UPE on the implications of keeping some of the space for a festival space, for K-Days, for other festivals, what that demand is and what that would mean to the development plans. Right, and maybe if, I don't know if uh, folks from real estate are on the line, but I, and I can see A being sort of a distinct body work and some of that is already in progress and we have business cases that we can be referring to, but for B and C, I think that, like I said, opens up uh, a much larger conversation um, that might be more, um, better suited to a committee uh, environment. I can speak to this a little bit. So maybe just as additional background information, my understanding is that Explore Edmonton has been, uh, has, I believe, gone out to tender on looking at potential planning amendments that could be made to the exhibition lands planning framework um, as part of what space they would potentially need in order to continue their operations and, and how they would want to operate into the future. So I, I believe that's underway right now. And I think that will definitely help to inform um, what comes back through this process. I just don't know how quickly they will have that information available. Okay, and, and maybe just back to the mover, um, knowing that some of that is underway on Explore Edmonton's side, um, would you be, would you be open to having that conversation around BNC, I guess separately or, or sooner rather than um, waiting for an unfunded service package and, and an operational review to come forward? Sure, yeah. Uh, if those were separated out to return to committee post haste, I'm fine with that. Okay, um, I mean, if that's, if that's friendly, uh, and maybe, yeah, I guess I, I think that would be a good way forward. Um, just back to administration, um, if those two pieces were separated out uh, and we were having a conversation specifically about BNC at, um, to return to committee, uh, is that helpful? Would, would you be able to have those conversations with Explore to, to be able to bring something back in front of council? I believe so. We're, we've been in constant dialogue with Explore in terms of the potential land leads that they may have within exhibition lands. Um, it's, it's really just a matter of timing in terms of how, how quickly they can really dictate to us what their needs are moving forward and then what the impacts would be to the redevelopment project and also the impacts on the performer afterwards itself. But would hope to work with them to bring something back so that council can consider that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd be I'd be very comfortable with that. Um, 
I don't have exact wording for for an amendment, but um, if that's friendly uh, to to the mover and to the assembly, um, that would be uh, yeah, yeah a way that I'd like to proceed at least. Yeah, it 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 uh, is friendly to everyone. So just we need to figure out the date for coming back uh, sooner. So can anyone suggest? When can it come? Part two and three, B and C, coming back sooner, right? Council Salvador, right? Council Karma. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, cool. and I would look to administration for um, when would be a viable uh, date for that to come back. Maybe I'll ask uh, Mr. Jiraki to confirm what timing they think is appropriate. So the the slight challenge with this is just around uh, with Explorer leading this, I don't know exactly how quickly they'll have their tender process complete and when they might have a, a planning framework coming back to us. Uh, we could aim for uh, Q2 of 2024. We could potentially aim for the end of Q1 2024. But we're, we're a bit reliant on how quickly they can advance that. But we'll work with them to try to get this going as quick as we can. But the idea is to get it back before the spring, so uh, spring budget discussions, if I understand correctly, right? So uh, it has to be by March. So um, maybe I would just ask that we say Q2. We'll, we'll get it here for the budget and whatever, if there is something that isn't complete because it's unavailable from Explore, we'll let you know what that information will bring you back as much as we can for the spring budget. Okay. Councilor Gardner? Well, if I'm permitted to comment on that, I would do it the other way. Uh, stating it plainly, Explore did not get what they need. And I know that there's considerable consternation for that right this minute. So if the instruction is get to Urban Planning Committee as an example by the middle of February to help us understand this better, chances are they will meet that requirement. So I would put the marker earlier and if they need an extension, it can work that way. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I, I guess the only thing that I would say to that is I'm, I'm completely fine with that. Um, we will bring you what we have. Yes. I just am a little bit concerned that you'll hold like we would like to be accountable for what we bring to you, but we can't bring you stuff that doesn't exist. 100%, I, yeah. there's probably room that if Explorer says we can't make the February date, but we can make the subsequent date, there's room for that. Yeah, got and, it. Like we do at ARC. Got it, so, okay. February, mid-February, whatever that date might be. This will be Urban Planning Committee, right? Which, which committee would this come to, sorry? Technically, it'd probably be executive committee because okay. it's related to funding. So, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's good. So, is that just so I can confirm? Is that just a friendly amendment? So yes, we'll it is friendly. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that concludes the questions. Now, Councillor, anyone to speak? We have only an hour and a lot of subsequent to go through. So, if you could speed up things, Councillor uh, Cardinal to speak. But we had an hour and a day. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I totally forgot. We are Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> wee bit of a skunk eye from the gallery there. I, uh, uh, I hear you, Mayor Sohi, so I won't take long. I, I do not think we can leave this ask unattended. Yeah. Uh, we have to say something in response to Explore, uh, and this is about the best I could come up with. I think that there is refinement to how it goes, and I hope that through this and a couple of other amendments I hope to offer that we can get some clarity and come to a, a clear understanding of what we can do for them. Thank you, so please vote. I'm a yes. yes. Hey, sorry, Councillor Prince is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. And was that Councillor Paquette or Councillor Knack, sorry? Uh, yeah, Councillor Knack, yeah, I mean, yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next you want one? me to continue? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so my next one would be a renewed version of OP8, my OP8. 
which reads as follows, that administration bring forward an unfunded service package for consideration by council during the spring 2024 supplemental operating budget adjustment to increase the Community Recreation and Culture Branch 2023 to 2026 operating expenditure budget by $2 million in 2024 on a multi-year basis ending in 2026 to support the event attraction program as outlined on page 6 on the addendum 1 of November 7, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report. Thank you, Councillor Cottmall. Is there a seconder? Second. Councillor Prince Okay. A uh, quick introduction, Councillor. Yes, sir. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, we did hear earlier that uh, earlier this month that uh, this is roughly the amount of money that uh, this branch needs to ensure that we have funding for all of the sporting events and uh, event attraction that we want to do over the next three years. Uh, there is a spectrum of events, including things like triathlon, but uh, extending into other things as well. Uh, so this delays the commitment from now until uh, sometime in April, if in fact we can make that commitment. Uh, and I'm not sure what impact that might have on leveraging dollars from other levels of government and from sponsorship, but this is the best we could offer at the moment. So again, not a commitment, but a consideration for when we get a little further down the road. Thank you. Got it. And there was a very healthy conversation at the committee about the need for this, right? So, and there was a motion for unfunded service packs. Got it. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Again, maybe just thinking, thinking through some of the, you know, where things live, uh, avoiding duplication. So just wondering about, um, how, how this relates again to Explore Edmonton. Do we fund them both to do event attraction? How, how does that work? Is that to me? That's to the move. That's my third amendment. Um, and I couldn't find a way to bundle it all together kay. without one of those three page motions. So I have a motion to consider exactly that question. Okay, the coming up as a subsequent. My next opportunity. On. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Okay, that concludes the questions. Uh, Councillor Cardinal to speak or? Nope, that's it for me. So please vote. Councillor Prince Bay is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay and Councillor Knack. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, Councillor Cardwell. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this next one then would be Supplemental Motion 2 in my list, which reads as follows, that administration request the Edmonton Sports Council to facilitate an update to the event attraction action plan, including but not limited to engagement with Explore Edmonton, Events Edmonton, Due North and any other relevant stakeholders and that the update include recommendations to Council on a future model that gives clear direction on the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders, governance, funding, types of events and interface with external stakeholders such as other orders of government, private sector sponsors, event producers, facility operators and advocacy groups. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, introduction question. So, uh, stating it plainly, uh, other cities have essentially sports councils or organizations by another name that do, a, do the at least the sports event attraction piece by themselves as one point of contact where everything else coalesces. So I don't know where that body would sit. I don't know which one is the right one to lead, but uh, to Councillor Stevenson's point 90 seconds ago, we need to identify who leads and who follows, and that has been disjointed. I spoke to someone as an aside just on Saturday night that has a sports thing that appears actually in one of the lists but they have no idea who to talk to, where to go and how to move along. So I have selected the Sports Council as the facilitator in this one because for the most part just about everybody else sits on the board of the Sports Council and so uh, and not everybody does, but most do. So meetings at the Sports Council can dive directly into this to talk about 
what the model should be, how it should operate, can draw upon experiences from other places and come back fairly quickly with a revised strategy uh, and set of tactics about event strategy and perhaps a revision to the to the model. And I know that's a little unusual because administration owns the document and we're asking the Sports Council to revise it, but I think that's the best place to get everybody around a table and have the conversation. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, to close, to vote? I only to say that those those three all kind of work interactively, and I hope we get a better view of um, of all of those things. Uh, I have another one that's sort of semi-related, and this speaks to the request we receive from external agencies, including the chamber, to start having a robust conversation about our ABCs and how they, what the gaps and overlaps might be between them. So I'm hoping to start that conversation with this set at least. Thank you. Thank you. Please just vote. Can I, just before you vote, can I just triple check? You want that to come directly to council, or do you want it to come through committee first of all? Because we might have speakers. Right. Uh, committee is, yeah. Thank you, Clerk Giesbrecht. Uh, clerk, uh, <laughs> committee is fine. Yeah. Committee is fine. Okay, good. Now vote, please. Councillor Prince Pena is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bain, Councillor Knack. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Cardwell. Uh, I have a fourth that reads as follows that administration provide a report outlining an assessment of all destination, marketing, and attraction activities in the city of Edmonton. Sorry, I'm sorry to the clerk, uh, my SM4. Um, that administration provide a report outlining assessment of all destination marketing and attraction activities in the city of Edmonton, which are administered by Explore Edmonton, Events Edmonton, the Fort Edmonton Management Company, Telus Rural Science, and any other city funded entities and propose options for funding these activities, including a shared funding model. Uh, seconder? Second. Councilor Stevenson, got it. Introduction, please. Same goals, a lot of the same agencies. Let's make sure that we are all working together when we lobby uh, the private sector, when we lobby other levels of government. We come with a cohesive approach where we're, we're all pulling on the rope in the same direction and not having our city-funded agencies competing for some of those things, but working in a collaborative way. Uh, hope that this gets at least the conversation rolling. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Cardamel. Any questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, not to close. Nothing further, thank you. So please vote. Councillor Prince Pay is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you, councillors. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Yeah, yeah, carry on. Got a quick one. That administration provide a memo. This, now these are not related to all that other stuff. Uh, that administration provide a memo, uh, number three, uh, to the clerk, outlining the advantages and disadvantages of changing residential permit costs to flat rates in place of permit costs proportional to construction costs. It'll come up. Second. Uh, second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Advantages okay. and disadvantages of changing residential permit costs to flat rates in place of permit costs proportional to construction costs. Okay. So in very broad strokes, the way it works now is if I want to put an addition onto my house, my permit cost is a proportion of the cost estimate of that addition, not a flat rate. So if I'm going to build that addition, I pay some proportion of my construction cost as a permit and the gift I get is increased property taxes when the value of my house goes up the next year. So it's a bit of a double whammy, should that be a flat fee? And I know the wheels are turning about the permit reserve and all of that, so we'll get some of that analysis. But the question is, and I don't know the answer, which is why I'm making the motion, do we get more uptake on the permit side of things when the permits are easier, easier to obtain? Do we get more compliance? Do we get safer structures? 
uh, how many permits don't get taken because they become prohibitively expensive when they're proportional to the construction cost or not. So let's find out. And that's by in the form of a memo. Good. Got it. Councillor Stevenson? Sorry, I'm, I've got lots of questions. Like, I keep jumping on. Uh, but appreciate the, the idea there. Maybe just to, to narrow in, so residential permit, do you mean sort of like low-density residential? Yes. Okay. Predominantly, it, yes. Okay, because I, I think Ms. Petron, that would be my, like, trying to remember, but like I think like a high-rise, even if it's residential, it's a commercial permit. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a different fee structure. So if this is related to small-scale residential, we'll okay. keep that in mind when providing the info. Okay, that's helpful. And then also to the mover, assuming uh, this is specifically building permit fees as well, not not the rest of the fee structures in terms of rezoning. That's I, right. Okay. Yeah, I, and thank you for the questions, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, small-scale residential and like not towers, not walk-ups, yeah. uh, and building permits, not all the other fees and stuff just I'm thinking primarily of that uh, homeowner that's building the addition building the deck even building the garden suite well yeah, yeah. and I, I mean maybe to Ms. Petron I, I mean I feel like I could see some advantage from an administrative perspective in terms of the difficulties in figuring out costs if cost is changing cost escalations um, do you see some potential for administrative streamlining with this oh I guess that's what the memo will talk about we can provide that information in the memo. Okay, great, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Seeing no more questions, Councillor Cartmel to close. That's all, thank you. Uh, please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe and Councillor Knack. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Go ahead. Thank you for your indulgence. Mm -hmm. I do truly appreciate it. Uh, I'm. This will be my last motion, and it's my number one. Uh, and I'm happy to take advice if this is necessary or not. So uh, the motion reads as follows: The administration provide a report summarizing a review of grants awarded through Community and Safety Wellbeing, the Community Investment Operating Grants, Family and Community Support Services. Edmonton Arts Council, Edmonton Heritage Council, and perhaps any other related agencies to identify gaps and overlaps in levels of support to nonprofit organizations. Need a seconder? Second. Councillor Hamilton. Okay, good. Just a quick introduction, Councillor. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, this came to me as part of a general question about how do we tighten up some of those that we uh, grant dollars to, and then. You've heard me talk about the other organizations, the larger ones. I'm curious about this. It, maybe this work is already done. I don't know. Uh, it struck me, though, that when I was speaking to uh, a lobbyist on one of these programs about one of the organizations that receives a grant, that that organization was talking about uh, mobility equipment, a wheelchair for a person. And noble cause, person needs a wheelchair, all, all really great. The province has an aids to daily living program that gets you a wheelchair. So the first thought I had was, how much of this are we doing where there's other agencies, other levels of government, other places where these things can happen? And I don't know, I don't know what the depth of the overlap might be, but I now have an apprehension and I'd like to check it. Great, thank you. Uh, questions? Seeing none, please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rutherford? No, just to speak. Speak, go ahead, please speak. I just want to say this is great. Um, one of the things that I've been pushing administration on is specifically some of the reallocation for OP12 that needs to happen, especially within family and community support services. I know there's been some reluctance because of the 80-20 split, but I think it's, it's not necessarily about reducing FCSS funding, but is are we using that funding and that grants appropriately? So I really wholeheartedly endorse this subsequent motion. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright? I'm sorry, is this for questions or to Speaking speak? now. Okay, well, speaking then, I will speak to it that I would also like to have included in, the, in this of the, um, the target demographics that, um, that these nonprofits also um, include. Um, because although there might be duplication for different um, 
different outcomes. It could be to various different groups. Thank right. you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Cardwell. Yeah, I will, I will just add this, that I, I'm aware that uh, and have uh, warned against a proliferation of motions that generate reports that then generate more motions. So there's been a bit of a flurry and we're kind of working to a clock. So uh, when administration fully considers this or any of the other ones, if there's overlap with other motions, if it's a duplication of work, if there's things that can be pulled together, into one report, I'm absolutely open to any and all of that. Uh, if, hey? Yeah, well, yeah, gender review might be able to manage that, but if there is, if there is, you know, similar motions that I have missed or things that are coming that are already re producing some of this, I'm completely and fully open to efficiency of work and efficiency on the administration side to, to uh, provide this information. Uh, Really, the, my overarching motivation in all of this here is to tighten up the dollars that we send out to our agencies, boards, and commissions, and not necessarily cut them. Just make sure that they are being efficiently delivered to organizations that, in turn, efficiently deliver stuff back to the city. Uh, that's the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cardamel. Please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe and Council Neck. We have 13 votes. And display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. That's it, right? Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. That's no, it. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? And I'll yep. take my turn now. I have the chair. Okay, the first one uh, is uh, OP to all subsequent. Uh, that administration as part of 2023-2026 operating budget amendment 12 work prior to spring 2024 supplemental operating budget service, but some, uh, sorry, supplemental operating budget provider report outlining options for an ongoing $10 million from the $240 million in Operating Budget Amendment 12 savings to be used to either reduce the mill rate or fund services prioritized by Council. Uh, we need a seconder? Okay, thank you. Uh, to it, uh, you know, we are experiencing, I think we had this conversation during the whole budget discussion around uh, OP12 that, uh, you know, we are experiencing considerable economic pressures and council has shown a lot of discipline in, uh, in only putting forward service packages that are absolutely necessary uh, in this uh, budget adjustment. And this motion uh, will give council the opportunity to make some decisions in the spring supplemental budget adjustment about uh, uh, funding additional service uh, uh, enhancements through reallocation uh, of uh, through OP12 or further reduce the, the mill rate that we, uh, 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 when we set that mill rate uh, during, uh, uh, during, uh, during uh, uh, in, in spring, right? And, uh, and it will also ensure that uh, there's a shared accountability for reductions between administration uh, to make recommendations and for council to support administration through making uh, those hard decisions. I think this will allow us to uh, look at all those different options. So that's the, that's the intent of it. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Does anyone have any questions about this? I do. So, Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair? I have the chair. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, I hate to do this, but is that ten million ongoing, or is that ten million of? <laughs> no, I'm ser I'm serious because we had this whole debate it, about the two forty. It's ongoing. It's it's ongoing ten million dollars. That's a serious question. Yeah, so ten million ongoing, because really, what OP twelve only, I guess, to the mover. It, though it's 240 million savings over the four year budget cycle, 10 million actually cuts in pretty deep to that work when you look at 60 million ongoing. 
No, so sixty million is separate from two hundred forty million dollars. Sixty million no. was part of the three hundred million, and uh, that been, that was already directed, right? No, that that was fifteen million. Si no, it was fifteen million times four for the sixty. Okay, please. I can answer. <laughs> okay, so our interpretation and what we confirmed with council was there were two parts to OP twelve. $15 million multi-year for a total of $60 million. You have reduced that. Like, it's gone from yep. the budget. Um, then there Which was... Which we talked about how that happened. Yes. Previously, just yeah. the other day. Okay. Yeah. And then there's $240 million, which we understand to be absolute value reductions in the cycle but which we said we would aim to find you 60 million, at least 60 million of it ongoing so that you could benefit from the work in the next cycle. So I do think that 10, this 10 million would be, if you want it ongoing, it would, and we find it, it would cover at least 30 million because yeah. um, so we'd it's be actually, three years. It's, yeah, it's a, th it's a $30 million really motion instead of a $10 million motion. Which, is what I'm getting at, right? If, like, if we find it ongoing saying, now, yeah. Well, this is saying, in this motion in front of us today, it's saying 10 million ongoing. Yeah. So this is really so it's 10. Million. It's 10 million of the 60 million that we're committing to find ongoing. It's 30 million of 240 million and didn't, absolute value. Wasn't there cautions, and I'm, I'm so sorry because I'm forgetting, wasn't there cautions yesterday about general, uh, generalized reduction like with this with this is the intent of this one similar in that generalized reduction so i have cautioned in the past about generalized reductions you when you reduce a budget and you don't tell us where to take it from i think what you're telling me is don't reduce your budget like you haven't instructed us to reduce the budget what you have in what you're instructing us is bring back 10 million dollars in ongoing adjustments that will reduce the budget. That means you decide whether you want to accept those or not. So, yeah, okay, so, but I guess I'm just so confused because aside from, so the intent and the spirit of OP12 was not cuts. So the reason I'm hesitant on this is that it says to either reduce the mill rate or find the council services prioritized, fund services prioritized by council. The fund services prioritized by council and the finding the money are already happening through the OP12 amendment and ongoing work. So the only difference is instructing them to find it before spring to reduce the mill rate. No, which or, is a or add services. So the council. So would you be fine if I if I did an amendment to remove mill rate? Well, then you will be limiting like at if my idea is to bring forward ideas worth ten million dollars that we would consider right? but that we're doing that with OP12 that's why yeah, I'm so not understanding this is part of OP12 too so what I'm saying bring it bring those ideas before the supplemental before we set the mill mm -hmm. rate so we can decide whether to take on those opportunities whether to reduce mill rate or we direct toward other services or if we feel those are the cuts we don't want to make then we'll make we then we will not make those decisions so it's kind of expediting the OP to all to do that ten million dollar work prior to the setting of. But, the mill but rate. we already have higher mill rates in 2025 and 2026. Like, what's the difference whether the mill? Like, I guess. Okay, I just. I'm not. I'm. We'll speak to this at the appropriate time. Okay, no worries. I return the chair. Thank you. And anyone else with questions? Okay, um, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Councillor Rutherford. I do have a question. I just couldn't sign on. Sure, please go ahead, Councillor Principe. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with your questioning. I just want to get an understanding that this is actually a part of the $240 million. It's not on top of the $240 million. Is that correct? Either to the mover or to administration? Absolutely. It's within the $240 million. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. That was my only question. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Councillor Prince Pei. Uh, is there anyone to speak? 
Uh, I would like to speak. So, Councillor Paquette, may you take the chair? Okay, chair, please proceed. Yeah, so I won't be supporting this motion because I think it's redundant to the work that we're already doing. And I'm very concerned about the reduction of the mill rate. One of the reasons I supported OP12 in the beginning was that it was about reallocation and not cuts. Um, and I, I can see this, this going that way. So uh, I want to be just really transparent that I'm not going to entertain that. And so I, I just don't want to entertain that even, even now because the rest of the motion, outside from that mill rate, is the only substantially different thing. So for those reasons, I won't be supporting it. And I'll take the chair back. I uh, return the chair. Uh, Council, uh, sorry, Mayor Sohi to close. Yeah, very quickly. I understand the redundancy part uh, because this ten million dollar uh, uh, motion is still within the two hundred forty million dollar that we tasked our city administration to find uh, with the intent of reallocation. So I also understand the intent that we are changing that intent now to uh, uh, to. Uh, possibly reduce the, uh, the the tax levy. So I want to, uh, the reason I want to do this, I want to keep that option open and ultimately it'll be a council decision whether we want to do that. But I want to kind of expedite the process that at least $10 million uh, should be brought forward for us to consider, right? But before we uh, uh, lock in that uh, the tax levy uh, by passing the bylaw that we do in, uh, in spring, so that's the intent. That uh, uh, there has been a number of unfunded service packages that uh, we did not consider. So it could be that we may consider those as part of uh, ten million dollars, or a combination of uh, reduction tax levy, or com and and some under uh, some, uh, some unfunded service packages. But there'll be a decision that council will make at that time uh, uh, if this passes and uh, administration brings forward. Uh, that uh, that ten ten million dollar uh, proposal, yeah, that's the intent. So that's it. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. Am I yes? Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have thirteen votes. Please display the votes. And that has carried 12 to 1. Please, I will return the chair. No, I have more. Oh, you have more? Yes. Okay, I will keep the chair. <laughs> uh, next one is uh, related to surplus land sales subsequent. That administration provided a report on the current status of the implementation of the land governance strategy, which was set in 2018, including, number one, status of regular inventory review, <laughs> an annual reporting of surplus land assets to ensure land is used optimally, or if surplus is civic needs, is sold for maximum value. Uh, number two, on an updated plan to accelerate dis disposition of surplus lands, including recommended short term by end of 2026, mid term by end 2030, and long term targets for surplus land sales identification of renewal and growth priorities that the funds from the surplus land sales could be put towards. Need a seconder? Second. And okay, just seconded by, sorry, just a second, seconded by Councillor Tang, and please go ahead with your introduction. Yeah, a number of my colleagues expressed a concern about our debt servicing costs, which I also share. Uh, it is concerning that we are spending tens of millions of dollars on uh, debt servicing for land acquisition for capital projects, while at the same time holding on to high quantity of surplus lands. Uh, the purpose of this motion is to get a comprehensive update uh, and, and plan to, on the implementation of the land governance strategy that has been in place since 2018 which I think is a really great approach for ensuring that we have a balanced and cross-corporate approach to land acquisition and disposition, uh, and which can be leveraged to, con to contribute to council, council priorities. Thank you. Yeah. And to questions, uh, Councillor Stevenson. 
Yes, thank you very much. I, you know, see see a lot of sense in this approach. Uh, the one thing it, it tweaked for me, though, is I think we'd had a conversation about uh, surplus lands, particularly in relation to LRT infrastructure that could be prioritized for affordable housing. So just wanted to understand your intent there in terms of we would still look for um, yeah. civic purposes and then the, re the remaining would be considered? Absolutely, once we have that. I, my understanding is that there is close to 2,500 acres of land that is kind of surplus in along major, like around LRT, not just LRT, other projects as well, right? So can is it fit for housing? Absolutely. If not, can we dis dispose of it and then uh, sell it market and use that for uh, other purposes? Okay, great. Um, and so maybe just... This is not la land held for future land development or... Uh, no, 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 uh, or, just the remnant, no. yeah, the remnant Yeah, rem land. remnants, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, like, I, I do feel, you know, I want to be be really strategic in that remnant land, particularly yeah. in how it supports access. So maybe just to, to administration, would that be your understanding that, um, you know, there would s this would, all the land would still go through a, um, the, the sort of municipal purpose um, process that I, I believe you, you already do um, before, like this wouldn't just be every land asset, it's, it's very much the surplus that wouldn't be suitable for affordable housing, for example. Yes, so maybe I'll just touch on this really quickly. Um, the way that I'm understanding is we're just providing an update on the process that we generally go through around any surplus lands that we have including the process that we go through in terms of um, identifying which lands we would be retaining and that would not be surplus because they're for affordable housing purposes. And then from there, identifying um, oh. and disposition of the lands. So that's doable there. We may have a little bit of challenge in terms of some of the lands in, in terms of stating when some of them might be available if they're used by existing projects right now and can't be released. Uh, but we can do our best to provide an overall update. Great. And and as part of your consideration, you know, I assume that there's a bit of a, um, uh, I guess just a consideration in terms of uh, if we flood the market with land, we'll, we'll likely drive down the value of that land. So just wondering if that can be, that will be part of the analysis. So we're always considering that. Uh, the one thing I would say is this is work that we're doing all the time. We regularly meet on all the parcels that are actually surplus to the city's needs in terms of when to list those, where we are listing them in alignment with the city plan um, and making sure that we can drive revenue back to the corporation as a whole. Um, so yeah, that fact that's absolutely factored in into the process, yeah. Great, okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Principe. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. I do have a question. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that when this is being considered, would you also be considering making sure that it's aligned with the breathe plan as well, so that uh, we're ensuring there's adequate green space? Yep, that's that is built into the process as it currently sits so in order for land to be surplus each area within the city has an opportunity to make sure that they're reviewing the parcels well in advance uh, and that takes into consideration affordable housing needs open space needs and others and once those lands are determined that there there is no need from a civic use perspective whether it's for park space or otherwise that's when it would be going through the process of actually looking to dispose of those parcels Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, but I guess my consideration is, or my concern is that if the potential full build out, if there's more potential um, a building or infrastructure in a community, that would decrease the amount of green space per person. Like if we have an influx in a certain community of uh, a lot of people, because of uh, construction, would like I, I understand that you know currently, but like looking into the future, are you making sure that looking into the future, the build out of the community will still have adequate green space? Yeah, 
And did you want to take this one? Yeah, sure, Council Principal. <clears throat> so as we talked about breathe, um, that is a critical component of ensuring that we do have the adequate open space and green space in our neighborhoods, especially as we're intensifying, as you noted, that's absolutely correct. Um, in the absence and until breathe is, is that work is done, um, there is a, a robust circulation process where site by site, <clears throat> those assessments are done to ensure that uh, we're capturing um, the, the opportunities and the needs of open space before they are surplus. So there, there is a, a process in place that does look to, to capture what you're trying to address, I believe. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Council Principe. Any further questions? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. And uh, anyone to speak to this motion? The mayor to close. I'll oh, look forward to the report if it's approved and uh, there'll be opportunities for discussion on this. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Please vote. I mean, yes. Thank you, Councilor Mack. In favor. Thank you, Councilor Jans. We have 13 votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. And do you have another yeah. subsequent mayor? Please I go do. ahead. I uh, do. Hap what happened? Here we go. This one, this is easy one. Uh, that administration provide a report outlining options to develop a three-day arc transit pass for visitors to Edmonton. Second. Okay. And to introduce, I had conversation with the administration and they see there's an opportunity for us to introduce a three-day arc transit bus pass to visitors coming to, into the city. And this could actually be a potential revenue source for uh, for ETS. So I want to explore that. I know what will come out of that, but uh, it is uh, according to administration, there's a there's a possibility of uh, raising additional revenue by encour encouraging more visitors to use transit if we offer them a three day long pass. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Does anyone have any questions? about this. What is the deadline for this? I don't see a due date on this motion to the clerk. We so this is in our OP12 ideas and so I think that this would come back, we could come back potentially as early as Andre committed the first OP12 report. Well if it's OP12 then I can leave it to you to do a deal with it. This could be done in relation to your first amendment from the 10 million we could bring it back. Okay so that. that's done, to, that's fine then. Okay. No, no need to uh, vote on it. I'll withdraw. So do withdraw. Okay. I'll so withdraw. is there unanimous consent for withdrawal of this motion? Okay. The motion is withdrawn. Okay. And, and another one? Yeah. I have a few more. And the next one is that uh, reinstatement of development incentive program subsequent. That administration provide a report for the reinstatement of development incentive program, including recommended improvements to better uh, to better contribute to implementation of the city plan. Need a seconder? Second. 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 Councilor Jans. Um, I'm not biased at all. Um, Please introduce. Yeah. You know, we just made a very difficult decision to uh, 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 cut the uh, uh, the development and center program. Uh, when I was thinking of moving that uh, reduction, uh, I was not thinking of uh, kind of a permanent reduction because we have, uh, because uh, I think as our situation improves into the future years, uh, I would like to reconsider that, right? Sometime uh, in uh, maybe 2025, uh, whether we can have the capacity to uh, introduce, but also uh, what are the opportunities for aligning some of the grant funding that we give to help us uh, achieve the objectives of the, uh, of the of the city plan? So just kind of a, had I, if I was able to put forward something to pass that grant funding for a couple of years, I would have done that. 
but that's not the process that we have to follow because once you reduce grant funding, you have to reduce permanently. So I would like to revisit that sometime in the, in the future if that is possible to do so. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Any questions on this motion? Anyone to speak? Mayor, would you like to close? No, good. Okay, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. <laughs> we have 13 votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried 13 to 0. Yeah. And the next one is that this is corporate revenues subsequent that administration provide a report with options to increase the assessment and tax service fees as detailed in the corporate revenues and expenditures corporate revenues table on page 104 and 105 of attachment 2 of the November 7, 2023 financial and corporate services report FCS 02052 to support increased cost recovery. Need a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Wright. Please introduce. Uh, I know that uh, administration does a, does a jurisdictional benchmarking to set the assessment and tax uh, service fees, and we just approved the bylaw, I think, a few months ago, setting those, uh, uh, those fees when we were looking for options to uh, uh, increase revenue. I looked into this area. I think there's a potential to modify some of these fees uh, uh, to recover the cost fully, not just for the day-to-day -day operation, but the infrastructure that's required to support all these fees. Uh, uh, for example, somebody pulling uh, uh, their property uh, uh, assessment only one time, and uh, we only charge them, my understanding at this time is for the uh, personal cost, but we probably don't be charging for the like what is back-end infrastructure required to uh, support that kind of pulling of the uh, of, of the papers I think this will be this will allow us to probably raise some revenue without impacting uh, 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 any 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 services or uh, or burdening people this will be a uh, in my mind probably a full cost recovery instead of partial cost recovery but we need to do that uh, with some discussion with the administration uh, on that yeah Thank you, Mayor Sohi. And any questions on the motion on the floor? Anyone to sp speak to it? <laughs> Mayor, you could really pass anything at this point. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, I just speak to no, no, no. No, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, Mayor, to close. Uh, no. Oh, uh, Councillor uh, Stevenson. Okay. I think this is excellent, and it's so excellent. I don't even need to speak to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Mayor, to close. Uh, no, that's it. Okay, thank you. Oh, please vote. Um, yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have 13 votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried unanimously. One more, and this is an important one as well. Uh, standing committee item subsequent. That administration bring a report to executive committee once a month for a discussion on program, budget, and service delivery and planning with the intent to provide insight to improve the budget process ahead of the fall 2024 supplemental operating and capital budget adjustments. Second. Seconded by Councillor Tang. And please introduce. Yeah, so every year coming into budget, I have heard council members express uh, concerns and frustration with the budget process and the level of information we receive. 
I have heard many of my council colleagues express uh, this both in this deliberation and through their public communications. Uh, the intent of this standing item is to ensure that the budget process works to support number one, council decision making, number two, better inform Edmontonians and encourage their participation, and number three, provide effective guidance for administration. Uh, this motion will allow us for an important shared conversation between council and administration ahead of the next budget to ensure budget process and documents work effectively. Uh, this process is intended to improve collaboration. Uh, other jurisdictions such as Calgary have followed uh, this process to good results, and I think Ottawa is, uh, is doing the same. I think uh, uh, we will benefit from having that uh, uh, ongoing discussion uh, on, on a regular basis leading up to the budget. Thank you for that. And I see there's some questions on the board. I'll go to Councillor Principe. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. I do have a question to administration. Uh, is, is that, um, you know, appropriate once a month to report back to uh, executive committee or, you know, would maybe every second month be adequate? Like what, what is the workload for doing it every month? I think that would definitely increase our workload and at the risk of sounding defensive, when we brought you the four year operating budget, we did have conversations in January about priorities. We updated those priorities in February. We brought you operating and capital investment outlooks. We spoke to you at the SOBA. We had an in private meeting. Um, and then we brought you a budget allowed for rounds of questions and then we have the debate. So I think if I could just some, get some clarity about what else you'd like as part of the process, that would also be helpful. Okay, I'll pass it along to the mayor. Uh, what What is um, your thoughts on maybe not having reported every month? I think we, we can make that determination if this passes, like how frequent, uh, depending on the information being considered, if we feel one month is uh, too burdensome, then we can look at two months as we did with the, the transit safety report that was monthly, then we thought, okay, uh, now we can move to two months, right? I think we can make that determination uh, 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 based on the uh, on the workload and the and the, and the need for having those conversation on an annual basis or or, or every second month. Okay, uh, those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair? I have the chair. Please proceed. Yeah, I guess. Um, to the mover. Why executive committee and not council if we're talking about, you know, sort of that budget planning and prep? I, I just worry that all of council has very divided and different perspectives. And so are we giving un unintended mm -hmm. power to the members of executive committee to guide that budget process? It I have no issues. Like if this one this needs to come to council, I am absolutely fine with that as well. And I think uh, they'll, they'll be, I consider that a friendly, but it was more my intent for executive committee was this kind of allows kind of a, le it's less constrained conversation, right? Uh, less structured conversation. That was the only thing. But if you want to come to council, I'm fine with that. Yeah, so I guess clerk just, I, I mean, I just want to, that's just one thing that's flagging for me. So, and you seem to be nodding. Do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I, th I think just as, as all these amendments are coming forward, I'm just flagging. So if something goes to committee, the general starting point is always to go to committee. The public then has the right, sorry, the public then can request to speak. Since the budget process is owned by the 13 of you, I think it makes complete sense that that Absolutely. report or that discussion would come to council once a month. Absolutely. That's fine. We could combine it with the up 12 updates, which might actually allow for a more mm. efficient process. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, so what amendment would you need for? So if we just change the administration as part of its regular up 12 updates, include this topic 
um, and that we just need to look at the frequency. Mayor Sohi, if you're married to once a month or if you're okay with Andre bringing that as part of his regular OP12 updates. I think we have that, sorry. It's okay, it's okay. Um, uh, I will just say that, that that's the end of my questions. I can take the chair back as long as we change the, I, I do feel more comfortable now that it's council and not executive. So yeah. I can take the chair back, Councillor Paquette. Quick question, Councillor Rutherford, are you make an amendment or is this just considered friendly? I think that the mayor has a few more questions and then somebody else might make the suggestion of the amendment. Okay, I return the chair. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead, Mayor, with your questions. Because didn't you just have some questions for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am okay with going to City Council. Absolutely, right. I, uh, uh, I'm okay with that as well as uh, aligning with, uh, with, with OP12. Uh, but OP12 comes to us every second month. Like how, how often OP12 is, is there is no consistent monthly or uh, every second month schedule, right? I think we've been bringing it as needed, but we've tried to bring it at least every second month. Okay. I, I prefer monthly uh, to start with, right? But uh, if uh, the will of council is to uh, every second month, I'm okay with that too. Okay. Yeah, so um, at this point, we know that there's a friendly amendment. Um, I, I, the, yeah, maybe this is where Councillor Paquette, I, I thought... Yes. Is there a friendly amendment by someone to make it the council? Yeah. yeah. Somebody other than me? Everybody. I can make that okay. motion or that suggestion. Okay, and it's that friendly. Amendment okay. To, uh, okay, thank you. Sorry. And then, so, and then I'm getting unanimous consent that that would be considered friendly for it to go to council instead of executive committee? Yeah. Okay. And then the OP12 or the frequency discussion, Councilor Ray, are you on the board for that? I am on the board for, yeah, let, let's talk, let's say it's frequency, okay. <laughs> okay, it, it, go ahead. It, it's, okay, so it's actually, it's, so our next OP12, I understand is gonna be in public. So then we would just go in private for this portion of it? I'm not sure this street. has to be private. The budget reports don't always have to be private. Okay. Um, okay, it's just a report. Okay, I think initially it was being thought to be in private. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm good with that then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wright. And any other questions? May... I just have some clarity on if this is to be separate to the OP12 update or if this is to be a monthly report to council. Um. I can make that amendment as well to have it um, come back with the OP12 reports. And is that considered friendly? Yep, yeah, it is I'm considered fine. unanimous yeah. consent yeah. friendly. Yep, we are good. Thank okay, you. Okay, so as it stands uh, with the friendly amendments, anyone to speak to this motion? Mayor Sohi, would you care to close? No, I'm good. Okay, thank you. And please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. And like, oh, we have 13 votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried unanimously. And are you complete with your subsequence, Mr. Mayor? Okay, I will turn the chair. Thank you. Okay, where are we now on the agenda? <laughs> Is there any more? Questions? No, I don't. I nobody has, uh, and anyone else has not shown any uh, indications that there are subsequent motions. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, point yeah. of order. Yes, Councillor Reyes. I I do have one as mentioned yesterday. Oh, you do have a subsequent. Yeah, I only have one. Go ahead, Very, please. Go, oh, ahead. One. Go ahead, please. 
Okay, so I will state this one and it's just for the information and the administration that administration provided the report that outlined the list of all capital projects approved as part of the 2023-26 capital budget, identify which of those projects can be deferred or cancelled identify the financial and infrastructure impacts and specify which of those are growth or renewal projects. Okay. Thank you so much. Need a seconder? Second. Con second by Councilor Principe. Can you make the introduction, please, Councilor Rice? Uh, yes, very quick, like I mentioned yesterday. And then this is just the based on some questions and from Adam Antonius to ask. Uh, in the capital budget and for 2023 26, uh, some projects uh, explore the opportunity uh, to prioritize our city's entire capital project. That's his number one purpose uh, to get that information. Number two purpose is about uh, identify uh, the growth and a renew project find that balance and because they concern as everybody knows and since last year budget deliberation we do not have enough investment in the renew uh, project this report will come back with the list and the information and provide information for the soba uh 2024 spring and for the budget discussion so discussed with administration and then a due date is a due date is a Q1 2024. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay, questions, colleagues. Um, yes. Councillor Rutherford. I know we're at, um, to the mover. We had an extensive debate about this early on in the term and that was discussed in terms of some of the severe consequences of canceling some of those projects and we made that decision at the time. Um, I guess I'm just confused as to if we already have that information, what new information you are wanting to generate from this report? I am not sure this list to be provided based on the new budget approved. And then is not asking for new information, is ask this information really provides the growth and renew project. I, I could ask a question to administration, is that information is already existing or this is- You can ask that on your turn for sure. Yes, yeah. Because um, I do know that, it, I mean, from my perspective, it is already existing. Um, for example, I know that when we discussed it last time, Lewis Farms Rec Center, Horlack Park were some that could be canceled, but with some consequences, but were less consequential than others. Um, yes, some of those decisions were made during this budget, but we have that list and the consequences of every, every capital, major capital profile that we decided on for the four year budget. So maybe to Mr. Lachlan, do you remember this conversation? Yeah, we had a lengthy conversation about this and uh, we identified the flags and risks associated with some of those uh, projects that could be considered. Um, if it's the will of council to hear some of that information again, we can provide a report. Would you would you prefer a report or would it be better in a memo? Like, it could, Or is it better as an inquiry? Because we are, could, wouldn't you already readily have this from the previous report? Well, we would have information related to projects that are already proceeding. What we wouldn't have is the information that was approved as part of the capital budget, specifically on the renewal side. I can say uh, I've been pretty clear that canceling renewal projects continues to dig us into the deficit of, of, of infrastructure issues that we have and will continue to have so um, but if council wants that information we can provide it okay I... it, it will have to have some form of of um, private attachment because there are um, contractual risks associated yeah, and that's with why i was trying to be careful about what i even said now from our previous conversation okay that's all my questions for now good okay i think can we extend the order to finish the agenda so moved. Second. Yes, this is just only last night. Yeah, this is it. Yeah.
Ok, please vote. Army, yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. Ok, that is carried. Uh, Councillor Rice, questions, please. Uh, yes, just a very quick question to administration. And because this motion specific request that one piece of additional information, I do not recall this is including the previous report. That is the uh, uh, implication or impact for fi from financial and infrastructure perspective. So I just want to get a clarify from uh, administration. And do you have all those information? If you have all those mesh, those information, I'm happy to just put inquiry or put the memo. I have no no problem for that, but I, I didn't recall that. This is how this wording developed. Yeah, I think we've articulated this information throughout the 23 to 26 budget deliberations. Uh, we've talked about renewal at length in terms of the infrastructure impacts. Um, it would be pulling the information together. I would suggest that we have some time to do that. Um, in the end, I'm, I'm not sure what value this provides because this has been an ongoing discussion uh, as part of building the 23 to 26 capital budget and continued discussions through the different supplementary capital budget adjustments in terms of specifically the infrastructure impacts. Uh, in, in terms of in, in terms of specific other pieces in this motion is about in terms of the uh, deferral and um, even though the deferral or cancel and the wording there does not mean we needed to do that. This is actually to address and to have this information to identify those projects and explore possibility and specifically to prioritize our city's capital project. Um, I didn't recall we have that list. We do have some like the very detailed profile and then identify the growth, identify the renew and then in different category. So do you think is that possible? Just put this simple list and we have this information and use this information for the discussion and in the spring uh, supplement budget adjustment. Well, I, I I mean, we can, we can pull this together for the spring supplemental, but then I start to ask the question of why do we do a four-year capital budget if at every SCBA we're going to revisit priorities? Um, but again, if it's the will of council to have this information for the SCBA, we can do that. Uh, so the priority visits, and I think a priority is not about the four-year cycle and the same and the four years later is the same. And then every time when we do the budget discussion and then we look at priorities and they may have the some opportunity to make some adjustment and but it's not a huge change. So I think for me, it's very, very simple intention just to get that information at all. So I... So for us, I think it would be better yeah. as part of the SCBA. Yes, okay. So then how, how this could be changed? Or, I think we can assume that on the basis of this information, should it pass. Um, okay, so that, that's all my question, um, Mayor Sohi. Thank you. Councilor yes, Rajivar to, to speak. Okay, so that concludes the questions on this. And now to speak. Councilor Rajivar. Yeah, I... I won't be supporting this. I think, you know, Councillor uh, Cartmel said it great when we've already, the bike lanes decision is done. We've relitigated, it's done. And I don't want to see that come back again. I, I didn't support a lot of the capital that's in the four year budget that I know as amendments, Councillor Rice, you did support. And I still support the overall capital budget because those are the decisions collectively that we made. And I think there's a difference between reprioritization of operations and reprioritization of capital. And it's going to make even our contractors leery uh, for bids and all of those kind of things. I, get, I think we're getting into very dangerous territory 
We have already had this conversation. My office is happy to provide that report to your office, and uh, then we can go from there. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rutherford. Can you take the chair? I just want to quickly. Yes. I, I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Rutherford. I think this motion, if passes, will send a mixed signal to not only communities that have supported those projects, but also to the business community, to the, to, to the construction community. Once we make the decision, we debate those decisions uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, vigorously. And, uh, and once they're made, they're made, maybe in very unique circumstances, you can look at uh, 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 you know, uh, deferring or canceling. And we heard clearly from administration there are consequences of uh, 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 canceling and also there will probably be added cost, not only for canceling but also deferring uh, into, the, into the future. I think this, is a, this will be a bad signal to add many aspects to, for us to, uh, to give and I hope that council does not support this. And I'll take the chair back. Returned. And I'll go to Councillor Rice to close. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sophia. I will be very quick. I heard the point, I heard the concern here. And what I try to do here is really address what I heard from our Edmontonians. And yes, and from our uh, project management perspective, and then we may see some risk. And however, from big project, from big picture perspective, uh, when we are build our city and from capital perspective, um, how Edmontonians look at the project and in the city, and I think they have that right to know. Um, even though I heard my colleagues say, oh, we have that report. I, I, I do know that report. So, um, Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, for offering that, but, but I do know that report. If our Edmontonians say they would like to say some less, they did not aware of the information already provided, that means and there is a gap there, and we can provide that list uh, if, the, if, if the information is already exist. Uh, so no other thing to add it. And hopefully, um, my colleagues could support this and at least to provide the information to our public and to the Edmontonians to look at our city's capital project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Please vote. I'm a no. No for me. Thank you, Councillor Nack and Councillor Tang. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Okay. Any notice of motions or motion without customary notice? Seeing none. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to once again thank you, uh, administration, for your uh, hard work. Uh, during the budget process. You know, budgets are always difficult conversations, something very testy conversation, emotional conversations, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, they can get heated, right? So uh, uh, apologize on behalf of council if that happened, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, to clerk, everyone, thank you so much. To budget office, thank you so much. This has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're, uh, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to each and every one of you for uh, guiding us through this uh, this work. Uh, and uh, so on behalf of Council, I want to thank you all of you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And now we are adjourned. <laughs>